you know, the injustices endured in black communities that we cannot ignore uh, or divert the injustices happening in child welfare, particularly for people of color. I hope that as this oversight committee continues to move forward, that we prioritize the need and the necessity of um, creating um, opportunities and conversations and action items that really address this in a very, very proactive and aggressive way. Um, because, you know, we're kind of the, 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 the police injustices are the end. I feel like child welfare is the beginning. It's the place where it introduces people into systems that at some point have a very, very devastating effect on their lives. So I just hope that we as a board and us as people that are working in child welfare recognize that our children are suffering, they grow into men, and then they're killed. And so I really hope that we uh, really look at uh, how we are approaching this subject matter. Thanks. Thank you, Shonda. Lani. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I wanted to take a moment here to read a statement that the Jamestown Squalum Tribe put into our local papers here this week. Um, and it's brief, so I just wanted to take a moment to read it. Um, the Jamestown Squalum Tribe stands in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement against systemic racism on Black people, Native people, and people of color. We vow to work for a world in which all people, regardless of race, religion, gender, sexual orientation, financial status, or education, share this precious planet free from inequality and injustice, recognizing that each of us deserves a chance to grow and thrive during our brief time on Earth. We join our brothers and sisters of color in the current worldwide movement against racism, oppression, and police brutality. We are opposed to violence of any kind. We pray for a world in which every human is treated with dignity and equality. We call for real change that addresses injustices and disparities, instills fairness in the criminal justice system, and offers reparations to heal historic trauma and poverty. We will never give up our dreams and prayers for a better world for all. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Lonnie, for sharing that. That is beautifully written, beautifully said, absolutely. Wow. Okay, <clears throat> it's gonna be a long meeting. <clears throat> um, any other um, comments? And I'm gonna turn to the second page. I don't miss anybody. Hi, all. Good morning. This is Lois. Hello. And, you know, what Lonnie just shared goes um, with my thoughts for a request to the oversight board. I was reviewing um, the statement that DCYF put out and thought it would be impactful okay. if the oversight you board yeah. pulls together yeah. something similar that we can share at least on our website for folk to access to acknowledge the time in which we're in, as well as the change that I'm hopeful will come. So I no longer have to worry about uh, my son or my brother or friends, neighbors. So I, that would be my thought. And thinking of it from the standpoint of maybe something that, um, a subcommittee could be pulled together those members who want to work on a statement similar to that and then be able to present it to the board for ratification and publication. Thank you. That's a, uh, I think that's a beautiful idea. Um, do people are people interested in, in uh, doing something like that as a board? I'm seeing lots of um, shaking heads. If you would like to be involved in um, working on a statement, um, can, if you want to just put that in the chat or um, you know, shoot me and uh, Ruth and Krista an email, that would be great. Um, do you just want to point out we don't have a meeting until July, obviously, because we're in June. Um, and so it, uh, it would either be, you know, obviously interim stuff or, um, but we probably want to have to present and discuss it at a, at another, at the next board meeting. But 
Yeah. Well, I think it's important because the movement is happening now, if folk are willing, and maybe you can, um, you know, ask that question to Tana for us to, I'm sorry, Representative Sen, forgive me. So we can have um, something where we can pull together. Um, and then I know Krista can probably provide um, guidance on how that could happen. Yeah, I, what we can do for staff, we can send out um, you know, a digital poll as well to look at getting together those individuals who wanna work on um, building that in the next couple of weeks so we could get more of an urgency in pulling that work together and getting it started. Um, and then work on scheduling from there forward on, on how to go for the next steps and making sure that we're also in compliance with our Open Public Meetings Act, but we can, we can manage that. Fabulous. Thank you for that suggestion, Lois. This is Stacia, if I could real quick. Um, mm -hmm. I, you could call, uh, this could be a subject of a special meeting that could be called together to approve. So there are mechanisms for um, approving something short of waiting until the next regularly scheduled meeting. Great, thank you for that. So we will, we will get some clarity on the process and maybe um, just at the end of our meeting, we'll just have a little, uh, uh, if, if Krista and Nicholas and Stacia have a little bit of opportunity to our meeting to do a teeny powwow to figure out, uh, if you need to give us any guidance at the end of the meeting on what we'll do next, but we'll certainly send something out um, so that we can, we can do it officially and do it right. Um, thanks, Stacia. Uh, again, I, I do think it would be really important and a beautiful thing to do. And I know there's been a request uh, for Lonnie's remarks, and I think that might be, you know, either a, a great place to have, and then also the DCYF um, statement, if we can also, if that's, if Nicholas, you can find that and put that in the chat for everyone to see, that would be great uh, as well. Any additional comments before we, yeah, Charles. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. And um, I want to thank everybody that's spoken so far. Um, I, I really appreciate, um, Lois, your, your recommendation to create a statement as a board. Um, and I um, think that'll be really important. Um, one thing that uh, I want to share from my role as representing child welfare caseworkers um, is that in regards to Secretary Hunter's statement that went out, um, there's a real sense from social workers that I've talked to um, that lip service was paid and that action is not visible. Um, there are several of the social workers that I've talked to that have raised in their you know, local office meetings, uh, the prospect of really putting out a, a stance as an agency um, for actually um, pressuring for change in policing, um, for uh, changing internally um, in regards to uh, child welfare inequities that, uh, that we are participating in as an agency um, have uh, been met with uh, kind of blank stares from leadership, um, it seems. And um, I'm hearing from my coworkers of color, um, particularly from my black coworkers, uh, that, that it is increasingly difficult to continue working um, for an agency that they feel uh, they are participating in oppression and that when they've raised these concerns, uh, that the leadership of the agency is, um, again, um, making nice statements, but not demonstrating any kind of meaningful action. Thank you, Charles, for sharing that. I think that's exactly why we have an oversight board um, and you on here. And I think um, when we discuss if we want to do a, um, uh, change the agenda up for the next meeting or focus on this topic. I think definitely uh, having a specific agenda item talking about what are the feedback loops um, and what is the kind of existing feedback loops and are there any additional ones and you know how do those get kind of integrated into um, policy or where, where do they go? Uh, I think should definitely be part of that in particular but um, Again, I, I really appreciate um, 
Charles, you sharing that. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I think it's important to uh, get the specifics from the department of how they are going to uh, address the issue and change the culture. Yeah. Um, we've been having those discussions, but the discussions on racial disparity have been very high level. So I think um, learning from the department what specific steps they're taking uh, to really on the spot or on um, um, you know on the line who but maybe we can figure out how to get some uh, some specifics in here from from folks uh, with more specifics too so thank you um, additional additional remarks or thoughts um, I'd like to add that it would be a good idea to also add um, you know, some resources for healing on the websites, um, such as mental health resources and ways that Black, the com black community can um, move forward to healing. Thank you. And, um, yeah. okay, great. All right, if there are no other comments, again, thank you everybody um, for, for sharing and just kind of taking a moment to, to be in this space. Obviously, uh, there's no way anything can happen these days without acknowledging um, what is going on in our world. But I think in our work in particular, our entire kind of raison d'etre is to dismantle systemic racism and uh, systemic inequalities and make sure people have a strong, fair start. And so um, I'm just, I applaud everybody for being part of this work. And this is uh, certainly a yet another um, kind of boost of a reminder, at least for me personally, as to why we are doing this work. So thank you very much for all being here. Um, with that, I am going to turn uh, the floor over to um, to Ruth to um, lead us in the next part of our agenda. Thank you, Representative Sen. Um, well, we have Steve Grilly and uh, Frank Ordway here to give us an overview of uh, what a network administrator is. But before we do that, I want to um, put out there that I am not an objective, objective observer on this issue. Um, I was the sponsor of several pieces of legislation which resulted in the legislature requiring performance-based contracting on the part of the SHS and then DCYF. And that came out of years and years of frustration uh, with the Department of Social and Health Services and the inability of the legislature to get information on uh, outcomes for children and families, on how contracts were being managed, uh, just basic data on things like parent-child visitation. The department uh, was unable to provide, after years of requests, any data on how many visits were scheduled, how many actually took place, what the outcomes were, what the costs were, um, it was unacceptable. There was a, a tremendous lack of accountability. So I just um, want to make it clear what the genesis of this legislation was and uh, why the legislature felt so passionately that we needed to change the way that contracts were managed and have more accountability for performance. Um, when uh, I know Sheila Morley is going to go through the sequence that uh, when the second piece of legislation was passed, um, it was difficult because no one would step up as uh, to become a network administrator. 
which was the vision the department had or the legislature had for managing contracts on a regional basis. And that is when Empire Health stepped forward. They had a lot of experience managing health contracts. Uh, so uh, that was the beginning of this journey to uh, really develop more accountability, strong data systems, uh, and an ability to manage contracts and be nimble and responsive to the needs of children and families and of contractors. Um, so with that, um, I will uh, turn it over to Steve Grilly, who is the DCYF Director of Child Welfare Programs, and Frank, Frank Ordway, who is the DCYF Chief of Staff. And I want to thank you both for here, being here and acknowledge that the department uh, has made progress in addressing the issue of managing contracts, and I know it's very actively working on it. Um, thank you, Ruth, very much. Um, my intent on in being here today was to initially talk about the budget situation very briefly and then turn it over to Steve because in our budget reduction exercise, we, we have included a reduction in the FIN contract. I've talked with Sheila about that. There are additional decisions that have been made that I haven't even had a chance to touch base with her on uh, just in the last 24 hours. Um, but I also want to just take a moment and I feel compelled and responsible to respond and, and to share a little bit um, in relation to how this meeting got started. Um, we run a system that was used, uh, the child welfare system that DCYF is responsible for running, was used as a weapon against Native Americans for millennia. It has been a tool to take children from low-income families and families of color for hundreds of years. It is riven, a system that is riven with institutional race issues uh, that are both inside our department, inside the uh, legal system that we work in partnership with here, and at very, virtually every part of the atmosphere in which this system works. So our collective responsibility to take that all on is, is very high, and it is something that the leadership of this agency acknowledges and talks about consistently and regularly in our work, in our meetings, and in our decisions. You will see us proposing things that are gonna be very controversial this year, that are hard, things like shutting down institutions, committing to more community facilities, diversion first. So we will be leaning into this, and we very much uh, hope, pray, uh, trust, this is a, not a moment, but a, but a movement, and the earth is actually moving underneath our feet, and we wanna do all we can to lean into that and to help that happen, and we look forward to your guidance counsel in order to do that. And I'm Charles, I'm just so heartbroken that you have not received support for those ideas. I, I, I'm not sure what took place there, but I can assure you that we are leaning into this and have been before the last six weeks, um, but we're leaning into it even more now. And it's just, but I recognize it's what you've experienced, it's your reality, and I acknowledge it, and I'm just heartbroken that that's it. Um, so we are uh, excited, daunted, but Primarily, I don't know that I've ever been more hopeful about actual real change in this environment in my whole life. And so I hope that we can all lean into this and be brave. Um, and in particular, for folks in my position, do a lot of listening and following and just try to leverage the position we have uh, the greatest change possible in this environment. Um, we have been through uh, a profoundly uh, stressful uh, few months, uh, both the pandemic and managing uh, all of the service delivery and, and everything related to that. And then, of course, the budget uh, situation that we all knew was coming that is now coming to a head. Uh, we uh, found out just yesterday, as all of you did at 10 o'clock in the morning, that, that most of our staff will be taking a 20% pay cut next month um, with no notice. Um, and so the stress internally is quite high at the moment, as you would imagine. And we've also been going through a cut exercise uh, that we were asked to do by OFM uh, that amounts to 155. Um, and that included a reduction at the time in the FIN contract. Uh, at the moment, I believe the state that we are in is we're going to extend it for into, next, into next year uh, at its current rate and kind of see how things play out uh, so we can give ourselves maximum flexibility going forward. That's hot off the pressure, Sheila. Um, so we are doing our best to manage a, a very uh, a rapidly changing environment. We don't know if the uh, legislature is going to come back uh, in August and make any adjustments or not, or if we're just going to be managing it um, on fly between now uh, and when they come back in January. So it's, it's um, created a great deal of stress, as you might imagine, and uh, calling people that are on our cut list, which has been my job. I've been sort of the grim reaper the last two weeks, calling people and letting them know what's going on. Um, as you can imagine, both internally and externally, that's not a lot of fun. But um, we have been uh, 
managing uh, through. The visitation system has been functioning um, uh, as best it can in this. And I want to now do my as graceful as I can pivot to Steve uh, to, to actually talk about the matter at hand. And I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you Frank. Frank. Sorry, I just want to just say thank you, Frank, for um, uh, for being a, a very gracious listener and acknowledging um, the, I don't say weaknesses or faults, that seems, no, those aren't the right words, but the areas of potential growth for the organization. And I think um, hearing our comments and the comments from the field is uh, absolutely the first step into making change. And so I really, uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, your genuine uh, listening and uh, interest in, in change. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, the comments were a gift. Okay, well, thank you, Frank. Thank you, Ruth. It's, I will um, dive right in. I know we're on a tight um, timeline this morning. I'm gonna share my screen here and hopefully this will be successful. Okay, can folks see that? Yep. All right, so again, my name is Steve Gurley. I'm the Director of Child Welfare Programs at DCYF, and here to talk with you um, in this morning segment about what a network administrator is. And I think probably the easiest place to start with that is to refer to our CW. I know Sheila's gonna go over a little bit of the legislative history of her presentation, but I have not duplicated that here. I just want to jump in and go right to RCW 7413B020, which highlights some of the aspects of the network administrator um, and defines that the network administrator, either directly or through subcontracts with service providers, assist caseworkers case in meeting their responsibilities for case plans. And they do that by providing family support and related services within <clears throat> the categories of services in those case plans. They manage the entire family support and related service array within certain geographic boundaries. And they have the authority with the department's approval to redistribute funding within the network based on provider performance to address service gaps. So what does this mean in sort of practical terms? If we look at the network administrator contract, Hey, Steve, Steve, I just want to point out your, your volume, I think, is a little, goes, is going in and out. I don't know if it's your headphones or um, other things, but I just want to recognize that for the rest of the board. Hopefully other people are experiencing that too, and it's not just me, um, but just wanted to let you know that. I appreciate that. I've not had that feedback before. I hope that this, is, is this better? Yes. Okay, let's hope this holds. Let me know if it does not, and I will manipulate the headphones here. Um, but getting back to um, sort of kind of what this looks like in practical terms, if we look at the scope of work, uh, statement of work, I'm sorry, for the network administrator contract, the intent of services in a nutshell um, frames what the network administrator does. So it oversees the support, the management, the monitoring, and the enhancement of a network of high quality effective service providers in support of performance-based contracting. And specifically in this case, that is, um, again, specific to combined in-home and visit or family time services in regions one and two. And the way that a network administrator would support and manage and monitor um, is sort of described in the other elements of the statement of work. So they do this by quality management, and that can include things like monitoring the quality of services, identifying needed supports, engaging parents and youth as mentors, tracking and maintaining provider qualifications, things like licensure and education requirements, attending to cultural competence. These are things that would all be in the quality management uh, uh, realm. The other thing that a network administrator does, uh, another thing is network capacity building, and that can include things like assessing gaps in service coverage, balancing supply and demand, and offering supports to minimize providers leaving the network. A network administrator also um, engages in data-led management. So the use of data to inform and drive the performance of providers. They manage uh, network payments um, and ensure timely payment for services. They also arrange for in-services and ongoing training for network providers. They've engaged in they engage in complaint resolution 
So there's a written procedure to address complaints or concerns from DCYF clients, providers, or community partners. Um, there's also a, a data dashboard. Uh, um, there's also an establishment of a data dashboard, so centralized and accessible reporting mechanism for service availability, geography, and provider performance. And then one of the other uh, final ele major elements of the statement of work, there are a couple more around data reporting and, and so forth, but is one of the other major ones is provider monitoring. And this is an established system for monitoring performance and quality of services, um, including on-site and desk reviews and compliance agreements where needed. So these are a number of things that the network administrator um, does in regions one and two. There was some interest as we talked to Krista about how we're doing this in the balance of the state. And so for regions three through six, we have a different approach. Um, DCYF utilizes internal resources to meet the RCW requirements in these regions. A family time policy guides the service across the state and visit coordinators were identified in regions three through six. Each region also has a regional program manager identified as a visit lead. And those visit leads are essential in the model because they're the advisors of the visit coordinators and they're a communication resource for family time contracted providers. So they're a liaison with the department and the providers. And in practical terms, the way that this works for other regions is that when a visit plan is established, the plan is entered into FamLink and then approved by a supervisor area administrator that plan feeds directly from FamLink, FamLink into a queue in Sprout, which is our web-based web data system that's now implemented statewide. And that is filtered to the field office where the visit is to occur. Visit coordinators then um, start assigning the referral to the contracted providers in that county. Providers have 24 hours to accept or reject the referral, and if rejected, the visit coordinator moves on to another provider until that referral is accepted. The caseworkers at this point no longer have to email or call or fax for referrals. Um, all that visit documentation lives in Sprout and is not required to be printed or stored in desk files. Um, we've achieved some um, efficiency in this area in, the, uh, in regions three through six. Uh, just a quick moment on Sprout for those that um, remember this as Oliver. This has now evolved into, um, in the family time realm, in, into Sprout. And this is a system that um, provides data that we've been unable to capture in the past. The statewide rollout was completed in March of 2020. And since then, there have been some high level data pulls. But we don't anticipate that the first official data collection uh, will happen until late August or early September of 2020. And the reason for that is that we wanted to um, work on a timeline that gave providers time to get acquainted with Sprout and um, get used to data entry within the system. And then um, we would work towards um, a, you know, a quality data set by uh, the time September rolled around. And you can see here some of the things that um, family, uh, that Sprout can capture for us, including exception, acceptance and rejection rate in support of PBC or performance-based contracting, timeliness of the first scheduled visit, also in support of performance-based contracting. Um, and it allows us to streamline the referral process and access visit reports directly in Sprout. In the past, those visit reports had to be faxed or mailed in hard copy to local offices for caseworkers to be able to access them. Now they can go right from their computer and they have the ability to view in real time some other types of information in Sprout. So this has been a real, uh, a real help and a, and a backbone to the family time service across the state. Um, as part of the wrap up of this section, I know I have a very uh, small amount of time to cover this. I just want to quickly reference um, performance-based contracting. And the reason that I want to move into this at this point is in some ways it's a lead into this afternoon's discussion of challenges in the family time realm. As we were talking with Krista um, about what the board might want to know around the network administrator, some of the questions seem to sound You're as if they're fading in and out again. I apologize. Am I back? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Some of what we were hearing as possible questions from the board sounded to be like evaluation questions. What is the performance of the network administrator? How does it compare to other regions? And we are, because we're um, very early in the date, statewide data collection phases, um, again, Sprout was uh, um, rolled out by the end of March of 2020. Our data collection is very new. So we're not at a point yet where we can conduct an evaluation of the network administrator. 
we will um, proceed to performance evaluation over time and looking to, looking to get to that in fiscal year 2021 when more data is available. But for now, what we do have are some robust plans for deeper evaluation through performance-based contracting. Team's done a lot of work around this um, and engaging family time in the performance-based contracting process. You can see here some uh, just demographic information at the top of the slide, but underneath in the implementation status, uh, we're at the, uh, we've uh, completed the PBC service standard phase. So we are in the performance-based contracting space. As many of you know, there will, each contract will be required to have a service standard, a quality standard, and, and outcome standards. Um, we will be working towards two quality metrics and targets in the fiscal year 2021 contracts, and then the outcome standards in the fiscal year 22, 23 contracts. So why is this important? Steve, I'm going to ask you to wrap up in about two minutes. Will do. Let me skip this slide then and go straight to here. Um, this will show you our con continuous improvement um, process here through PBC. If we start at the top left of the corner, uh, top, top left corner of the slide, you can see that we're collecting data through Sprout. And then as we move from collecting data to analyzing, that data will be analyzed by o OIAA. And then that process to sh uh, share that data and the, and the analysis with providers. Uh, that will then, as we kind of move around the circle here to inform, improving performance, um, allow us to look at initial data to validate and adjust quality metrics and support the addition of a performance management tool. And this process will um, continue for continuous improvement. Um, ultimately, in the future, we're looking to get to regular analysis and sharing PPC data, um, a performance dashboard that, uh, through which we can share those results with providers, and the linking of Sprout uh, with family so that we can get to some of the more compelling questions that we have around service availability and how it connects to permanency outcomes. So for example, does service availability impact length of stay or rates of reunification, questions that right now we, we can't answer. So I'll leave it there. Um, Ruth, I know we need to wrap this up, but I just wanted to set up for our discussion later um, by talking a little bit about- uh, Okay, thank you that. very much. Um, sure. We do want to hear from both Finn and providers, so, um, but we have a few comments, so our questions. So I'd like yes, to limit that uh, to about five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy, you had a question? Um, both questions and comments. Um, Wendy Thomas, um, the rep representative um, for tribes on the east side here. Um, good, after good morning, good morning. <laughs> Right. Um, I, I was um, employed with the Kalispell tribe during the um, performance, the implementation in region one. And the three tribes over here, Kalispell, Spokane, and Colville were not thrilled with the decision about performance-based contracting um, for many reasons. Um, one, one of which it was, we were not included on that decision-making process. Um, so again, that's something to um, consider um, in the future, our tribes and how state services impact tribes. Um, I also did have the opportunity to sit in on the um, network administrator interviews and in which there were um, only a few. Um, so I have a little bit of information, a little, you know, different here and there, but what's most important is how it impacts tribes and um, the lack of monitoring. And so I did look over the RCW and how this is probably really great for DCYF and, you know, data. However, it's not, I, I'm curious as to what data you have on tribes and tribes utilizing state services because I mean, something as simple as, um, you know, how many tribes are utilizing state services, but also um, we had an experience, we experienced um, some very um, unethical behavior on some parent or parent child program. And um, <clears throat> I contacted my local um, region here and asked how we can make a complaint. Nobody knew how to make a complaint. 
um, and this is from the state workers and our state contacts. And, um, you know, I think I wrote an email. I don't know whatever happened to it. No one ever called me to ask. And what it was was our parent child visitation worker um, offered a parent who was utilizing the service to purchase one of their, you know, like a puppy. And, you know, talk about, you know, boundaries, lack thereof, et cetera. And so just wanted to make sure that, um, you know, during these times, state services and changes do impact tribes. And then also there's no communication between Finn, the services and tribes. And so I can imagine, you know, if the data was captured there, there'd be a lot more. And, and of course, us uh, being able to utilize services is great. Um, Again, like we don't know what services are offered. We don't know, I mean, there's just no communication there. And so I wanted to make sure I said that because that's truly from a tribal perspective and how, um, you know, performance-based contracting has impacted tribes from the East side anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And Lonnie, you also had a comment? Yes, thank you. And I, I had three different questions and I do want to be respectful of time. So if Responses to these questions need to come after. Um, I'm fine with that. Um, but a lot of it did have to do with evaluation. And so when I'm thinking about especially capacity building, uh, since I am part of a rural area, area out here on the peninsula, I was just wondering how the network administrator, well, okay, I'm also in region six, but network capacity has always been an issue for those of us uh, that have programs in rural areas here in Washington. So I was just wondering how the administrator or whoever is overseeing it in region six um, or in any air, rural area here in Washington, how is that capacity building actually happening? So that was first question. Second question being, how are all of these elements that the network administrator is supposed to be doing, you know, the capacity building, the quality of services, things like that, how are those all being evaluated for success? And then, I think more of a foundational question is why are there different models between the uh, regions in the state? So why does one and two have one model versus three through six? Thank you. Thank you, Lonnie. Thanks, uh, Lonnie. I appreciate your uh, posing the questions and allowing the states for them to be answered later. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Steve, very much for your presentation and I wish we could spend more time uh, discussing it with you, but we will have a conversation later in the agenda. Um, so at this point, um, we're going to have a presentation by Sheila Morley, Erica Halleck, and Julie Dozier. Um, the Family Impact Network, as has been stated, is contracting with DCYF for regions one and two. And Sheila is going to talk to us about Finn. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So I think that is that everybody can see my screen at this point. Great. Thank you. That's the hardest part, making sure the technology works. So. All right, well, thank you, uh, DCYF Oversight Board members. I appreciate the invitation to come and talk to you about the work that Finn has been doing in our role as a network administrator uh, for the, the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. My name is Sheila Morley. Um, I'm the Executive Director of Finn, um, as we commonly call it. And I've been with Finn since 2016 and in the Executive Director role since July of 2017. Prior to coming to Finn, I managed funding and strategic planning for homeless services at the city of Spokane. And the years prior to this, I worked in the homeless system, providing direct service, uh, developing programs. And in my work in that system, um, in all those years, I saw such a strong intersection of families that we serve in, uh, in the homeless system that were also connected with child welfare. Some of the most memorable projects that I was able to be involved with during that time were in housing development, um, where families that were experiencing homelessness and connected to the system were able to um, access housing directly. 
Uh, during that time, um, I also volunteered as a CASA for the Spokane Juvenile Court. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce Erica Halleck, who's going to come on here. Uh, Erica works with Finn on government relations, and she has a few introductory comments for us. Thank you, Sheila, and thank you to the Oversight Board for inviting the Family Impact Network to talk about its role as a network administrator. And this is a complex topic and issue that is, has had a lot of history associated with it. Um, the slides that both Sheila and Steve presented have rich information there, and I just want to make the offer. I know we have limited time today, so if folks would, would like additional information, we'd be happy to set up Zoom calls to go into this a little further. Um, we've been involved since 2014, and I'm just remembering the twists and turns of the last six years, and of course, you'll see from this slide here, the history goes long before that as, as Co-Chair Kagi is, is well aware. Um, so just scoot, scooting back to that slide real quickly, um, this slide is meant to demonstrate that there's been significant and substantial legislative work in the area of both network administration and performance-based contracting. And a lot of times you will hear the terms performance-based contracting and network administrator a little interchangeably, which can be a bit confusing. And I think uh, Co-Chair Kagi, uh, hopefully she would concur with me that the original thought was that the network administrator would deliver um, performance and inst institute performance-based contracting. Of course, as things have evolved and Department of Children, Youth and Families was established all contracts by the agency are now performance-based. So it's changed a little bit over time. And you'll see from this slide that we've had a lot of twists and turns, as I mentioned, including a 2018 legislation that extended the network administrator role east of the Cascades. And, and Lonnie has an excellent question as to why the role of the network administrator is only in a portion of the state statute does provide for network administrators statewide. However, the way that things have rolled out, it's only in um, regions one and two at, at the moment. So we're here today to talk about that work that Finn is doing in regions one and two, and I'll turn it back to Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, I, you know, I often get asked what a network administrator is, and um, we, we've worked together with the department um, and our provider network over the past years to, to really define that role. Finn's intent with this work is to support the work of the department, our provider network, and, and really have the greatest impact on families. Finn's provider network consists of 42 service providers who, who directly serve families in family time or visitation and combine in-home services, which provides therapeutic services. Finn manages the contracts with providers directly. So what uh, pre was previously held by DCYF is now managed by Finn. Uh, with this, we take on the risk and the commitment to the department that they will receive these services. And in order for Finn to meet that commitment, we need a strong provider network. So much of our focus has been on building relationships with providers, getting to know their business practices and understanding their needs. This and the data we collect on service delivery helps us to improve each provider They come directly to Finn and to our resource team. That team takes the information from the referral and makes that connection to the appropriate provider. Since the, the beginning, our mantra has been every referral is a family. And what that means for us is that on the end of that referral, there's a family that needs a service. And so we always focus our intent to get the most appropriate provider for the service requested and as timely as possible. This is really the sole purpose of this team. And with that goal in mind, we've developed a system that ensures timely services by providers. So as referrals come in, the team gathers all the information from that referral, compares it with all that they know about the providers, things like, will they um, accompany a Sunday visit? Uh, do they serve medically fragile children? Do they have staff that would transport a child from Curlew? all the way to Spokane and back for a visit with a parent. So they, they know all that information about the providers and they use that to make the best connections with those services. 
Uh, to ensure the timeliness of service, we have an expectation of a four hour response from providers. Um, and this requirement has really led to some good timeliness outcomes for families. Another component of our work is uh, quality assurance support. In this area of work, we manage the contract and all the compliance components. We audit and process provider billing, share provider data on performance. We work directly with the providers one-on-one uh, -on -one to help them understand that data and help them troubleshoot how they can make improvements. Uh, we also facilitate training opportunities for all providers to increase learning and consistency in practice. Because we have such a diverse group of providers, our approach is individualized and hands-on. My team meets face-to-face -face with providers frequently. They've been in all of their facilities and they understand the ins and outs of each provider. We don't wait for an annual site monitoring to let a provider know if something is not going right. We use a continuous quality improvement model. The quality assurance and compliance work comes from the mode of supporting that provider in every way possible to improve the quality of services to families. All this work combined creates a balance of managing the network of providers, ensuring high quality services, and ensuring that DCYF social workers request a service that the service is available and the services and the family's needs are met. I've included this frame as um, just for your reference, it shows the progression of FIN in our work with the department to implement network this network administrator model. As we move forward through the presentation, you'll see some data points that identify areas of success in the provider network. You will also see a highlight of family time data. Um, we, we also have data from our combined in-home service array that for the sake of time, I haven't included in this presentation, but would be willing to share at any time. The two primary data sources for this information that you'll see is, are, are from an internal data system that, that we've developed that tracks the uh, progress and the history of referral. And um, from the time that FINS receives it, and the other data source is really from provider uh, billing submissions. We use this data to, to inform provider and the network performance within the network. So this is FIN's service area. Our service area is comprised of some of the most rural and under-resourced counties in the state. In fact, the average miles driven for a family time visit service in Region 1 is 160 miles. The rural nature of much of this work poses a challenge, um, as previously mentioned, as we try to recruit providers to serve in rural communities. As you can see from this slide, Finn has done a wide service reach in these 20 counties. Um, as noted in, um, in the documents that you'll see in, in Steve's presentation, we see high percentages of disproportionality for children of color in our service area. An approach we have taken to date has been the offering of training opportunities for providers on cultural competency practices. We make these trainings available to increase awareness at the service delivery level. This equity work is prioritized by FEN, so we have secured private funding that will be used to support providers over the next two years. One of the outcomes of this funding is to increase the knowledge of cultural practices for providers in our network. We're just in the beginning phases of this work with our providers and we're excited about the prospects and the ability to be nimble in our approach. So if you look at this slide, it shows all the areas where um, we feel the network administrator is a value add to DCYF's mission of protecting and supporting families. In addition to being a partner with the agency, we work with other stakeholders. We've been a pilot program for STRIVE, which is a supportive visitation model for the past several years. Uh, we connect with our foster parents and parent allies in, in our service area on a regular basis, and we bring them together with our providers to help create understanding. Some of this work has led to a change in the family time intake process and approaches that are more parent friendly. I recall one meeting several years ago where we facilitated discussion between family time providers and parent allies where those parents expressed that when they were in the child welfare system, how nice it would have been to have a place to cook and eat 
with their children in a more natural setting. This discussion led many agencies in our area to adapt their facilities and their practices to accommodate this. Finn was able to, to step in and support these providers that needed financial help with this shift, and it's really been a huge success for families. So this is a, just a quick snapshot of the number of referrals uh, Finn manages monthly. Each of these service referrals are a child that needs a visit with a parent, a parent who needs a therapeutic service, or a parent who needs a car seat to keep their child safe. So in collaboration with the department, our staff are fully focused on executing the services which result in frequent and consistent visitation. We have a five year uh, deep dive into family time and through this we've had, we found some opportunities to innovate and we've seen some really good results. I really enjoy uh, the highlight that in our, our first area in region one, children um, receive the first visit with their parent within four days of receiving a referral. Beginning in 2015, Finn began working with DCYF and the University of Washington on the development of Oliver, which um, Steve talked about. It's a data system that is used for visitation services. As that pilot for that data system, we were able to test processes and provide input um, driving that implementation. Oliver, which is now named Sprout, is used um, statewide for family time. So service capacity is always uh, top of mind for us. We are always discussing this and talking uh, about capacity, especially in under-resourced areas. So we need to have a sufficient number of providers to deliver services uh, that families need. And at the same time, we need to, to manage so that providers have enough referrals to keep them financially solvent. It's really uh, quite a juggling act and our team takes this role very seriously. So over the past five years, um, we, as some providers have left the network, we've been able to keep consistent service delivery to families through this constant monitoring of service capacity. So as I've mentioned, the oversight and support we give providers is focused on improving provider performance and in turn, the quality of services that families receive. An example of how we support through oversight is in uh, provider billing. Uh, billing for family time services is generated through Sprout. Our billing team audits each billing submission and our quality assurance team works with the providers individually on their data collection process, which impacts billing, and all that mixed together really results in, in clear, accurate billing. Um, throughout the presentation, I've touched on how FEN accesses philanthropy uh, funds to support network providers. And I just listed some examples of some of the ways we've been able to leverage these private dollars that providers would not have access to otherwise. So we've been working alongside the department to improve outcomes for families and have had the ability to test some new approaches. These are three examples that were derived by DCYF and Finn was able to uh, test their successes. So for the sake of time, I won't go into detail on each project, but I would be happy to provide any additional context at any time. So we wanted to take just a, a couple minutes to talk about um, kind of uh, the COVID response and how, how that's kind of played out on the ground for Finn and, the, and our providers. Um, so in, in recent months, we've all maneuvered through this COVID pandemic where systems um, have had to quickly turn and everything's been very unknown. So navigating through those transitions with providers and with DCYF has really emphasized to me the day-to-day -day work that Finn does as we manage the network. We were able during this time to be an innovative, nimble, and responsive partner to DCYF and our providers. And looking back over the last few months, it's pretty amazing what everyone has been able to accomplish. Providers have been willing to adjust with the changes. DCYF was able to provide guidance in a very chaotic situation and come up with a payment model that would, would keep providers solvent. 
it really took everyone involved, uh, providers, parents, DCYF, foster parents, um, everyone to shift to virtual services. Through this time, Finn was able to think outside the box as we were looking to maneuver this shift. And we were, at, so what an example of this is, um, just kind of came up, came to mind yesterday is, so part, we were part of DCYF's effort in the technology effort to get technology in the hands of parents and caregivers. So virtual services could start. We uh, ran that through uh, our concrete goods program. So early in the process in some stakeholder meetings with foster parents and with our court partners, we heard a concern from them um, about participants that um, might lack the uh, technology knowledge to set up and operate um, the phones or tablets. So we immediately started expanding uh, our tech support, which was originally just designed for providers to parents and, and caregivers by uh, creating an 800 number that was manned six days a week that anyone uh, that needed assistance could access. So yesterday I heard, um, I heard a story from someone that, our, our staff person that's managing this, of a grandmother who over the last few days had been uh, provided the technology um, so she could do virtual visits with a child, but really did not know how to make it work. <laughs> so our staff person, June, who's managing that tech line, uh, was able to work with the grandmother over three consecutive, consecutive days to troubleshoot. Um, and yesterday, she was uh, able, uh, with the family time provider, to facilitate her first vi virtual visit. So that was the end of my day yesterday. It was a great story to hear that we've been able to play a small part in getting that grandmother and that child connected for a virtual visit. Um, it's, uh, I really appreciate your time. I know we're pressed for time and I'm going to pass uh, the next part of our presentation over to Julie Joshier from Caring Hearts. It's one of our family time providers. She's gonna speak a little bit more to Finn's role during the COVID response. Julie, are you, are you on? Julie? I'm looking for Julie. I saw her earlier. Are you hearing me? Yes, hi Julie. You are. Thanks so much for joining. I'm gonna turn it over to you, Julie, thank you. Julie, you're on mute. Julie, you need to unmute yourself. I believe I did. Is, are you there hearing you me go. now? Okay, there perfect. Go. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Julie Dosher, and along with my business partner, Jill Clark, we own and operate Caring Hearts Social Services Incorporated. We've been operating under the family time, previously the parent-child visitation contract, and providing supervised visitation for 21 years. We're based in Yakima, where I manage the main business office, but with facilities and staff in Yakima, Ellensburg, Spokane, Auburn, and two facilities in Tri-Cities. And region one, two, and three is our focus. We also provide services from other regions because we have a lot of treatment centers here in Yakima and the surrounding area that house clients from all over the state that come here for treatment services. We currently provide services contracting with Finn in region two and one, and with DCYF directly in other areas. We began working under contract with Finn about a year and a half ago, starting in Spokane. In March of this year, Finn expanded to region two, and we now contract with there. Being a contractor, in the current COVID crisis has been very challenging, scary and uncertain for us, as well as our fellow contractors. We know the importance and responsibility we have to provide services and keep families connected, but these have been uncertain times as we navigate how to change the way we've always provided services for families. Suddenly safety, health, well-being, as well as exposure for all became our biggest concerns. Not all regions are in the same position, as some have lower COVID numbers, some are allowing opening of their cities before others. And especially in Yakima where I live and run our business office, it's been very worrisome and frightening for our families, placements, our staff. 
Having the support and help from Finn in these regions has been vital to our agency. They quickly went into action, scheduling provider meetings weekly, sometimes several times a week as needed so that all providers were kept in the loop. They helped right away when we started video visitation, setting up guidelines and steps to ensure that we providers could move into this new process. They arranged and managed ordering of devices, laptops, phones, Wi-Fi, Zoom subscriptions, for all families and placements who needed them so that we could make the visits happen for those that needed that assistance. We had excellent support and constant communication with Finn. I especially appreciate our agency's resource specialist, Jenna. She is our go-to person and usually our first contact. All the Finn staff are responsible and helpful, but Jenna has become invaluable to us. When contacted, we get a response from her right away and she acts on it the very same day. No matter what our question or concern is, if she doesn't have the answer, she gets it for us. As contractors, we have never had such fast and efficient support and it is so appreciated. This is very different than the way we've navigated through changes and concerns during the last 20 years prior to Finn. We continue to be supported through the last few months while we provided virtual visit visits and a retainer we received from the state enabled us to pay our rent, keep our business going, and pay our staff. We have successfully succeeded in retaining all of our staff and it's made a very scary situation more bearable without the worry of how we would be able to keep our business afloat. Now that we are moving into in-person visits, Finn has supplied PPE, masks for clients and staff, cleaning supplies, thermometers, and things we needed to each of us visitation providers. They are still ordering and continue to track things on back order so that we can receive supplies as quickly as possible. This would have been a very big expense for us to try to absorb as a small business. continues to be so. However, due to the family courts and pressure here, I've had no choice but to move to in-person before we have supplies, before we're ready, and under less than ideal circumstances for my staff and families, where the numbers rise and it's still very risky to open. Finn has kept in constant communication with me almost daily, watching the numbers, tracking, listening to Yakima Health District concerns and reports, and they have shared that information and spent the time to ask the questions and communicate with DCYF all along the way to guide us about serving families in what is still a phase one area and not considered safe. We also continue to benefit from programs that's created to help us on protocols, safety guidelines, reporting, cleaning, and ongoing suggestions and recommendations as things have changed. We providers are receiving ongoing support and there is a large effort to see that we all have not only what we need for supplies, but the proper protocols and procedures in place to remain in compliance with this new way of doing things. The time Finn has spent in creating these helpful guidelines and protocols so that we can continue on with the work we need to do has saved hours for our agency, as well as my fellow contractors. No one expected this would happen. The constant changes, different information, adjusting to what's required all takes time, which they have focused on for us. So that we, it's, it's been a real struggle and a challenge, but it's been scary, but we're hopefully expecting better times ahead. And we are really looking forward to the time when we can just jump in full bore and provide services like we've always done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, we do have uh, time for questions, about 10 minutes. And uh, Lonnie had a question, or excuse me, um, Lois had a question in the chat box. Yeah, I, I, do, I do see that. Thank you. Thank you, Lois, for that question. Um, off, off the top of my head, I saw the question. I'm trying to do the math in my head. Um, we have six of our, um, of could you repeat the question? So oh, of, I certainly could. Yes. Um, how diverse is the leadership team for Fen? Does it reflect the communities the organization serves or those providers uh, Fen partners with? If not, what is the network's equity commi commitment? That's a, that's a great question, Lois. We, we have actually been very committed as we've, um, 
uh, done hiring, uh, especially as we moved into to region two, to, to really make sure that we were um, hiring people that, that mirrored um, the, uh, uh, the populations that we're serving. Um, at this point of our, I believe we have about 36 or 35 percent of our staff are are of diverse, of different, um, coming from different uh, different backgrounds and races, and they're really able to provide additional supports. Um, we have a a provider in Moses Lake um, that is is a, a great man, and and he um, would always call uh, one of our quality assurance. Uh, specialist uh, to, and they would always speak in Spanish. So <laughs> I would hear them from my office speaking Spanish out in the, uh, as they were on call. So um, I think it's, it's just been a, a great experience to have such a diverse team and we are very committed to continuing in that form. Sheila, you have spent a lot of, uh, a lot of effort uh, recruiting and capacity building in the region. How, how is your capacity building uh, going in terms of getting diverse providers? Um, you know, uh, getting a diverse provider pool is, is very difficult. Um, it, and uh, we find it, uh, it more difficult with combined in-home services than uh, with family time. We're very fortunate to have a very uh, a diverse uh, group of family time providers, especially in the central Washington area. Um, and I would say in combined in-home, um, it, it has been, a, a, we're always looking for ways to recruit um, and bring in bilingual uh, providers that can provide services. And uh, we've, we've had made some good efforts in those areas and actually been able to bring on um, quite a few bilingual therapists of late. Um, but, but it's always a challenge. But again, it's always something that we're considering. We were just going through, um, as an example, uh, uh, we had 15 uh, therapists that applied for a, a training for a specific um, program that is going to be happening here in the next few weeks. And uh, we prioritized uh, people for that training that were bilingual at, for our, our recommended group. Um, so because we know the need for bilingual services in those areas. So. Okay. Hi, this is Wendy Thomas. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, so with the data that you have, how are you capturing data from the tribes that are utilizing services? Thank you. Sure. Uh, Wendy, thanks, thanks for the, um, the input. We, through, through our process and our data collection that we're able to gather, um, we uh, aren't able to distinguish, uh, the referral doesn't really distinguish where, the, where it's coming from as far as if that is a tribal um, a service or, or in the other DCYF office. So we don't really have the way at this point with the data access that we have to measure that. It's a great Sheila, one of, the, um, one of the concerns the legislature had uh, when we required performance-based contracting was uh, particularly in parent-child visitation, the high number of supervised visits, mm -hmm. and which are much more expensive, right. um, and monitored visits. And I know that you have significantly reduced those. Have you been able to calculate any sa the savings that the department recognized through that shift of uh, only having supervised visits when they're really needed? Yeah. And have you been able to shift resources to services as a result? So um, I would say that the, um, the shift to supervised visit or from supervised visitation to the least restrictive, um, kind of our, our role in that work is really in the provider network to get them moving. And so when social workers are requesting those services, that they have them available and ready to go. So our work, um, especially in Region 1 with the Region 1 uh, field office, was really hand in hand with the discussions around this is where our number is and this is where we, need, we would really like to get to. And um, you, you see from the, the previous slide that there was a decrease and a consistent decrease and I believe we're at about 57% 
of, of uh, visits that are ordered through us for a contracted provider are in supervised, where it had been in the 90s when we first started collecting this data. So we were able to work with our network to get them ready to do that work. Um, and um, we, we have not been able at, at this point to do any cost analysis to show the difference. Uh, we have all that information. It would certainly be something we could work with the department on on trying to pull together to see what the differences might be. Okay. Thank you. Ben Dahan, you had a question? I do. Thank you, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sheila. It's very nice to see you again. You. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, I do. It may be too early to, to tell, but Frank mentioned this morning that uh, that you were slated uh, for cuts in this uh, in in the next budget or in this budget actually um what impact is that going to have on uh, on your operation and do you have any idea yet what that will mean for you yeah i well i, I think what i was i was surprised to hear frank say that they were planning to extend into this next year um you know but we've been doing some thinking around that and what that might look like if there were cuts that that happen um and it really would be uh, having to scale our either our scope of what we're doing now or uh, potentially the the area that we're in. Um, we were just kind of waiting to to get some more information on kind of what that might look like before final decisions were made. So it's it, it's really too early to say at this point what the implications so. are. I said, okay, thank you, appreciate. Thank you. Sure, Frank, do you have anything to add? Sure, I'm happy to. I, I can say that the cut that we suggested originally was scientifically devised. I mean, we had two weeks to do our work, and there were some areas of contract monitoring that we thought we might be able to bring in-house and maybe save a couple of bucks. But we were, our intent in that suggestion was not touch any of the direct services or, or really reduce the ability to administer the network. Um, but fortunately, right now, we're in a position where we've been able to um, a plan that we hatched just yesterday uh, in conjunction with OFM around a host of contracts and bills that need to, answers that we need to um, come to before July 1. Uh, this was one of them. Uh, the decision was to extend it at its current rate as the normal rate for three months and see what the legislature does if, if they happen to come back and do a special session, if there are any federal movements. So we just tried to get as much flexibility in this as we could um, rather than administering or pursuing a reduction now. So I'm hopeful that we can hold on to it throughout this process. but. Everybody saw the number yesterday. It's a big one. And so um, we're going to be scrambling and looking under our couch cushions for every uh, opportunity to avoid making cuts to direct services to people. Mm -hmm. Ben, do you have a uh, follow up question? I do. Thank you, Ruth. Um, Frank, I noticed if I read it correctly on your um, on the spreadsheet that talked about the cuts that you were going to be seeking legislative approval or statute change to make some of these cuts? Well, I, I don't know that we're going to be pursuing them necessarily, but a number of these, including the requirement that we have a network administrator, are in fact legislatively required and in, in some cases legislatively funded. Um, for those of you who are um, you know, familiar with your basic civics, the legislature controls the purse strings. And I'm a little bit um, candidly, I'll just be direct with everybody here on the thing, I'm a little bit unnerved about only going toward the executive branch to make these decisions. This should be a collaboration. Um, and so, Ben, we're in sort of a, a funny spot. You know, we've been apt and directed to do cuts, but a number of those cuts are legislatively uh, required and currently funded in our budget. And so we're in a funny spot here. And I don't know how else to, to say that. Um, so um, I think that a better process would be that everything that we we're putting forward would have a much higher degree of legislative consideration and partnership with the executive branch in these decisions. Um, that's just not happening at the moment. So I say, well, thank you for that. You I, I recognize you're in a tough spot. I'm just trying to sort out what- Yeah, no, it's, I appreciate that. And it's, um, I wish that I could give you more crisp answers here um, than I'm able to at the moment. That's, yeah. That is where we are. We have not been asked um, you know, we've obviously are doing the, the staff freezes, contract freezes, um, the furloughs that were announced yesterday, and we've got a, a list of reductions that we are suggesting, and we are working through those um, basically on a case-by-case -case basis as they come up for decisions. 
Um, and that's how we're trying to administer it at the moment. So, so I'm sorry to, to hog the time here, but just real quickly, then you don't anticipate going to the legislature and asking for changes in the statute no. and uh, eliminating no. the network administrator concept. No, no. Thank you. That is not, and, our, and I would say that really across, there's only a couple of our cuts that I would suggest are signals um, for directions that we wanna go or areas that we've been asked to spend money over the years that we just don't feel are um, really serving the mission of this agency, and that is not the case here. Got it. Thank you. But excellent question, Ben. Um, yeah, not a reflection of a great question. Katie, you had a question about caregiver retention. Yes. Um, hi, Katie. Thanks for the question. I was I was just answering it in chat, but I will answer directly to you. So. Uh, we, we do not have the information about retention, uh, caregiver retention in our area. Um, we do engage with caregivers in our, in our communities, um, mostly in the frame of gathering feedback uh, from them on how things are going in service delivery. Uh, we, we participate in their, uh, in their uh, community meetings, their foster parent meetings. Um, and uh, gather feedback and, and uh, we, they also access our complaints module. Um, they, have, they know where that is. So if they have a complaint about a provider service, they have that um, ability to, to form a, a kind of a formal complaint which we then investigate. Um, but in general, we, we've had some experiences where we've brought caregivers and providers together to talk and, and just kind of learn from each other. Uh, which has probably been the most helpful um, uh, part of, of kind of that that interaction. So hopefully that answers your question, Katie. Frank or Steve, does the department keep caregiver retention figures that you could compare regions? I think that would be something that we'd have to check in with Luba and um, licensing about, Ruth. Um, I don't have anything off the top of my head, but we could certainly um, pursue that. Okay. Bobby, you had a question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a quick one, I hope. Um, with respect, this is for Sheila, and with respect to your work on um, your words, uh, shifting from supervised visitation to at least restrictive alternatives, um, to what extent was um, the court engaged uh, with you as you um, proceeded with the providers in trying to get them to be more receptive to it. I mean, it's all emanating from a court order after all. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, uh, in, in the Region 1 area in the Spokane, um, Spokane court system, we have a really good relationship with that, that system and we often participate um, in uh, their uh, monthly forums at where DCYF Region 1 leadership comes and Finn comes and we talk about these things with them. So, um, it, yes, so that is that is part of our, our process here in Region 1. So there's ongoing communication. Yeah, and, it, and, and, and it's really strong communication between the Region 1 leadership and Finn kind of in those in those meetings. So we, we kind of come together and report out together. Sheila, I have a last question. Um, one of the strengths of Finn has been the ability uh, that you have to really analyze data, and particularly on visitation, but also on family support services, and to manage contracts and really uh, have accountability for the funding that's being spent. With the shift of Oliver to Sprout, do you still have that ability? Um, so uh, when, when Oliver s switched to Sprout, we, we lost a little, some of that ability. So we, at the early on and, and through kind of the development of Oliver, we were getting monthly reports that are part of our kind of contractual requirement to, to report out uh, to the agency. With, when, when it changed to Sprout, some of that um, kind of went away. We, we didn't have access to that any longer. So we don't get the monthly kind of in-depth data reports at this point. Um, 
and and Sprout is now uh, in statewide. Um, and so I think that the plan and and Steve and I have talked about this um, uh, in great detail is that now that that um, Oliver is kind of out across the state, uh, we are now able to kind of be, become a part of the planning process and have a pro use the kind of our knowledge um, as a provider voice to help the department um, kind of come up with some potential reportings that would be available to all providers so they can see the data that they're entering in the system. And then we would be able to, again, use that information to help us to guide the, um, the performance of the network. Okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sheila and uh, and Julie, and the for all of the work that you've done and for presenting it today to us in this in this panel or in this presentation. Um, and we look forward to uh, further discussions with you and watching the progress of uh, of FIM. Um, we now uh, have come to public comment. Ruth, I'm, gonna jump, I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, we were we want to make sure that all the comments that have been submitted in our mm -hmm. chat box are being read out loud, just in case we do have member or anyone from the public attending on the phone that's not able to read them. Um, so we've read most of them. I just want to go back real quick. Um, and Stacia is on the phone too. She's the one that's giving me this guidance. So if Stacia, you do want to jump in, feel free. Um, but just want to read through that um, last few minutes, Frank made a comment that one of the biggest issues facing family time is funding. We struggle to deliver the services to the west side of the state in particular. The rates do not support a viable contractor base to do the work. Um, and then Vicki Ybarra from DCYF added, DCYF has published caregiver turnover rates in past reports at the state level. See, for example, this report produced annually. It seems as though producing these kinds of data at a regional level would be possible. Um, Steve and I can look in on that, and she has provided a report from the DCYF website um, that is accessible to the public for the adoptive home placements of 2018. Um, is that good, Stacia? Do we? Is there anything else I need to follow up on? Um, thank you, Krista. I just a reminder to everyone that that you do have members of the public uh, who have called in and therefore can't see the chat boxes, so it's really important that the conversations be done in the in the meeting itself um, not through the chat box um, i understand you know some need to let krista or someone know that you have a question or perhaps um, post the question so krista or somebody else can read it but we need to be very cautious about making sure there's not additional conversations going on just in the chat box that the public would not be able to see thank you Thank you, Stacia. Okay, Ruth, if you want to, I'll turn it back to you for our next agenda item, which Nicholas will then manage. Nicholas, I, we'll, we'll just go right ahead. We'll go on to we, our next agenda item is the public comment period. So we have 15 minutes to allow anyone who is not a board member to contribute to public comment. Nicholas, who's the administrative coordinator for the DCYF Oversight Board. Um, we'll read off the names one by one to allow individuals to make those comments to the board. So I hand it over to Nicholas. Great. Thank you, Krista. So first up, we have um, our own board member, Charles Loeffler, who will be reading a message from a DCYF social worker. So let's go ahead, and Charles. Uh, thanks. Hold on one sec. So this message um, comes from Stephanie Grover. Uh, who is a frontline social worker at the King West office in the adolescent unit in Seattle. Uh, Stephanie writes, um, Good afternoon to all. My name is Stephanie Grover. Uh, I interned at King West for two years during my time in graduate school and now have spent just over a year of employment with DCYF. Before working with DCYF, I worked for over 10 years with youth and families in a variety of settings and truly feel that empowering our youth is the most productive way to improve our society as a whole. I feel it is my duty to my clients to come forward and advocate for changes to our agency. As a frontline worker, I am tasked with being the standing guardian of youth who come into care, a responsibility I take very seriously and feel extremely passionate about. 
I can tell you with 100% confidence that our youth are very in touch with their place in the world, whether it be related to race, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, or other types of isms that they may, subject, may be subject to in their lives. I am tasked with being a standing guardian to these youth who are facing some of the biggest questions related to their safety in the world, their identities, and their capacity to respond to what is going on in ways that feel meaningful to them. And at this time, I am angry, upset, and disappointed that our agency has not taken action related to the ongoing racial violence in our country on behalf of the youth that we serve. Oftentimes, our young people in care enter the world without the structure of parents, mentors, or role models whose guidance might be afforded to other youth. Where are, uh, where are these youth supposed to turn to find the guidance that they seek? If they come to me, their social worker, I feel underprepared for how to make these youth feel empowered when I am channeling the agency that I represent and instead will rely on my personal thoughts and feelings to hold these conversations with my clients. However, I also feel that at this critical time, my personal thoughts and feelings are not reflected in the agency I serve, which has been much too passive and silent in response to today's issues. I want to work for an agency that aligns with my values, an agency that will respond appropriately to the changing world around it, and an agency that will use its position and power to act on behalf of vulnerable communities. Our youth need guidance, they need people to process big emotions, they need to know their value in the world. I believe it is irresponsible of us as the agency tasked with providing parental guidance to our youth to leave them high and dry in this time of great need. If we are going to stand in communities across the state of Washington and say that we provide safety and security for youth, we must act decisively to take a stand to protect our clients against racist police violence. We must look closely at how our agency can use this time in history to change long-standing policies related to police, law enforcement, and disproportionality for the benefit of our clients and communities. There is no greater call to actionable change than right now. I want to take this opportunity to respectfully call upon our leadership teams to work together to develop policy changes related to how DCYF interacts with law enforcement agencies with the goal of reducing law enforcement impacts on our youth and families. I would also implore our leadership team to think critically about what it says to our youth, families, community partners, and other affiliates when DCYF does not take this opportunity to act as silence often speaks volumes. Thank you for your time, Stephanie Grover. Thank you very much, Charles. I think uh, hearing the perspective of social workers who are in the field uh, trying to meet the needs of children and families is particularly valuable and appreciate uh, Stephanie stepping forward. And I, I, am, uh, I am sure the department is very focused on this and uh, I think these comments will really help the department move forward with a specific strategy for how we're going to address those issues. Great, thank you, Charles. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, we have next up on our public comment is Lori Lippold. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to start by saying that I really appreciate the heartfelt comments and powerful comments that were made at the beginning of the meeting and then followed by this one that you just read, Charles. It's so, so critical. Um, so to be brief, I want to just again say how incredibly valuable it appears to me Finn has been and now the evidence of that is so clear when a number of us are on calls regularly about how things are going with in-home services or parent-child visitation and just the consistency um, the ability to share information, to get out to the providers, things that you heard today. I, as more of an, a viewer, a bystander of this, have really, really seen come to fruition. Um, there was also some money that uh, was generously given by the, the philanthropic community to look at some additional concrete goods and services for families and others, and Finn was able to step in and manage that for the state, basically. Um, I, I don't mean for DCYF, I mean the state of Washington, the providers. So 
it, it's just been incredible. I want to go back my memory of one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons why we did not see more organizations apply or bid for the contract way back. Uh, and only, not only, I mean, fortunately, Empire Health did step up, as was mentioned, is that a number of the agencies had just come out of a very long, grueling, expensive, resource-driven process that went down the tubes quickly in 2011. And it had begun basically in 2009. So I think it was just something a number of organizations could not embark upon again. Um, but, it, but fortunately, Empire Health did step forward. So that was great. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is that a number of us, or a small, small number of us, have really started talking about how can we turn foster care on its head? How can we really start making a difference in terms of what goes on within the foster care system to put into real practice and meaning what is happening around the country, around the world, um, to, to change things, to say we have been talking about racial disproportionality in the system for a long time. We have had a child welfare system operate pretty much the same way for centuries. And we have got to stop doing that. And continuing to kind of do the same things that we've been doing is probably not going to lead to anything different. So I've been very appreciative of many of the comments today. And a number of us have been in conversation and will continue that and look forward to, to working together with all of you to really make some of these changes. One final comment is that um, Sheila mentioned her work previously in housing. We have seen survey after survey of parents and a recent one, it wasn't a huge sample size, but over a hundred parents who were recently surveyed and they identified what was, these are parents involved in the child welfare system. What was their, what were their biggest needs? And the number one biggest need identified for the majority was housing and, and our Funding streams, our big funding streams don't allow for that. And now money that we had is on hold because of COVID and, and freezes and such. So that's, I mean, just such a clear example of the need to really figure out how to, how to do things differently. So what families do need to be able to effectively and safely parent their children can really happen. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Lori. Great, thank you, Lori. Yes, our final public comment is Jill May. You're on mute. You're on mute, Jill. Thanks, Ruth, sorry. Um, thanks for letting me talk, I'm Jill May. Uh, I am with the Washington Association for Children and Families and our members uh, provide prevention services to families that are at risk of entering foster care. Uh, child placing agencies and BRS agencies providing therapeutic foster care and group care. Um, so you, you can now tell what COVID's done to me. It's turned my hair pink. Um, boredom is bad. Um, I, I just want to say uh, briefly that um, I too appreciate Finn, uh, Sheila, and Erica and the team there. Uh, we've always worked together, but during COVID it's been even more important to have a, a, a support system, I guess, uh, if you will, of being able to go through all the changes and keeping track of all the changes. So I really um, uh, want to thank um, Sheila and her team. Um, I also want to reiterate uh, about Sp Sprout and the importance of us being able to get data out of Sp Sprout. Many of our agencies are child placing agencies with family time contracts. And would really like to be able to do their own quality assurance um, and better understanding the work that they're doing. So um, I would love to see data being able to be provided to providers or them be able to access it, access it themselves. Um, I think lastly, what I want to say is, is that I, I really um, urge the oversight board um, to meet with um, agencies privately. Um, many of our agencies are, are fearful of uh, speaking up um, because of fear of retaliation. I think uh, many agencies or, or many people will ask 
you know, give us specifics about retaliation means. Um, I think that if agencies are at fear of speaking up, um, that in and of itself is an example. Um, so I think there's a lot to be learned um, that isn't being shared here and, and maybe in public venues. So I would ask the oversight board to reach out to a handful of agencies. Um, uh, I think that might be helpful in your in your work. Um, lastly, I just I want to talk a little bit about visitation briefly. Um, you know, everyone's um, goal is is to get back to in-person visits as quickly as possible. Um, we're having a lot of challenges. The folks from BCYF on the phone or on the, the meeting right now are fully aware. I've shared it with them. Um, but you know. A, a rush back to services and in-home is, is, is a little bit unrealistic given, you know, fears of providers and fears of staff and fears of providers. Um, I think there's going to have to be a lot of work done to quality assurance of providers and how they're adhering to the, to the guidelines. Uh, I heard the, the protocol, I heard recently that um, uh, a provider was not um, pro uh, following the protocol um, and the mom had a fever um, and now has um, obviously all of the foster parents have been um, had contact with with this parent through their child so I just I think that this is uh, important something to take seriously um, and really consider sort of the health um, uh, needs of everyone involved so um, again I've talked to this way about this, they're fully aware of concerns of me and other other people. So um, uh, we're anxious to get back, um, but I think we need to move cautiously. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Jill. And uh, I think the oversight board uh, will need to consult with uh, with our attorney to see uh, our capacity to meet privately with providers and to uh, have those conversations. Um, I do think it would be valuable, but I, I think we need to be sure that we're adhering to the restrictions that we have. Um, okay. Um, and just to call attention, we did have two board members submit comments on the chat box and um, I will let Lo um, let me know. We just need to make sure people on the phone are uh, are hearing the same comments that are made oh, in writing. Right. Thank you again for that reminder, Krista. Basically, I just wanted to thank Charles for um, sharing Stephanie's letter and for pointing out, um, if you would share my thanks with her as well, for pointing out the systemic inequities that impact our youth and especially our brown and black young people and children. So just wanted to thank um, Charles for that. Thank you, Lois. Shonda, did you want to make your comment? Sure. Uh, my my uh, question or comment was actually to uh, uh, Frank. And I just said, I just want to point out that your funding has been a struggle for some time within the department regarding funding family time. If your staff followed its policy on working aggressively and timely towards achieving unsupervised visitation, the budget constraint would inevitably be the remedy. The action would also actively support removing some of the racial inequity that adversely affects families and subsequently supports achieving reunification. And just a small other little comment there is, is just, you know, I, I recognize that you guys are, you know, working from a lot of different angles of trying to, um, with, within the confines of the budget. And I'm just looking at outcomes and just ways for us to achieve, you know, us moving our families towards each other. And the time that it takes to get a family to unsupervised visit is right when you're getting ready to return a child home. So I, I just hope that, you know, internally, you guys can really address this issue. Your policy is not being followed. And, and I think that you have some of the answers. It's just internally really trying to implement them and make it happen. Thank you, Shronda. Well, I think, uh, Frank, do you want to make any comment? Okay. Um, the department and the whole state is obviously facing uh, an unprecedented budget challenge. And uh, 
is working as best they can to uh, navigate through this uh, this pandemic and the deep cuts that are going to be taken in state government. So I think that context is really important to keep in mind in addition to the tremendous pressure the department has been under to respond to COVID and, and, and now to respond uh, to the broader issues that are uh, being raised in our society about racism and uh, the need to uh, address in a very substantive way how we do our work. Um, so uh, with that, I want to uh, go ahead with the provider panel and start with a thank you to the providers um, who are uh, working under extremely difficult circumstances um, and have been uh, really doing a yeoman's job of trying to serve children and families in a, a, time, in a historic time. Uh, so the provider panel that we have is a facilitated discussion uh, with placement providers and contracted visitation providers on their experience working with DCYF. And the, the, I, the whole point of this panel is to try to understand how contracts are managed and how contractors experience being managed in the, the uh, network administrator model and in the model where contracts are directly administered by the state. So Angela Kramer is here from Angela's Family Services, Nina Hill from Ameris Family Services, Jacqueline Tut, Lorene's Place, and Debbie Hood from Reliable Enterprises. And I'm gonna ask uh, Angela to go ahead and we have uh, some questions that you've been provided with uh, to, uh, to respond. So uh, we will start with Angela. Uh, since contracting with DCYF or FIN, please describe what works well, where you would like to see improvement with your current working relationship with the department or with FIN. Thank you, this is Angela. Um, in response to that question, um, I do like that when I reach out and I call people within the department, they answer my calls. I can call Deanna, I can call Tim, I can call Steve and the regional administrators and they answer. I may not like their answers, but they hear me and oftentimes sympathize. We all do their, our jobs for the children and families that we work with. They're fighting for us and I feel truly that they are. Um, but their hands are tied. A lot of um, the issues that we have are around budget constraints. Um, you know, we, we have not seen a budget, you know, increase within visitation for many years. Um, you know, as, as you just, somebody had just stated um, that we're in an unprecedented budgeting, going into an unprecedented budgeting time frame right now. But we have not recovered from the last recession. We received a 30% decrease um, the last recession. And even during, during times of prosperity, that rate was not addressed. And I believe that the department understands that um, and they are compassionate towards our need for that, um, but their hands are tied. So I do like the fact that, um, that they hear us and they try in the way that they can. Um, with that said, I cannot express enough, especially with COVID, my agency has been significantly impacted by the lack of communication organization of the department. I have lost a huge number of my staff with no rate increases in several years. The chances of getting any rate increases um, slim to none, not getting paid for miles from mile one, not getting paid for admin time. A rate, um, the communication from the department just put so many people over the edge returning to face-to-face -face visits without properly being prepared. Um, so uh, there's a lot of um, miscommunication and confusion within the department. Um, we are not prepped to return to face-to-face -face visits, even though we have been asked to um, several weeks ago. Um, when DCYS um, first took over, um, we were encouraged that they would have more funds and more flexibility at their disposal. 
And we haven't seen much of that. So I have been disappointed by um, not seeing any of those additional resources um, given to us. So Angela, you are in region one, correct? I actually am in all regions. So I um, have people um, spread across the entire state. Okay, so it would be particularly helpful if you could address how your work uh, is different in region one and two, as opposed to the rest of the state. If there is- I'm glad you asked that because there is a significant difference. For those that are not aware, Region 1 um, has had a pilot rate for the last couple years. So we get paid from mile one um, on Region 1, and we get a $2, um, we get a $2 higher rate um, in Region 1 than we do the rest of the state. That rate difference has made a huge impact. It's made an impact because I am able to recruit people. I am able to keep people. I'm better able to train people. Um, I'm, uh, I'm actually able to have um, facilities in that area. Now my contract, I don't carry any other contracts, so I only have visitation services. So in some of these bigger agencies or other agencies in the western part of the state, they have multiple contracts. So those that do have office spaces have more than one contract, so their other contract is able to support them being able to have facilities. So the rate increase directly impacts our ability to be able to recruit, maintain, and keep capacity. My communication with Finn specifically, um, I know Finn was the ones that advocated for the pilot rate, um, and hopefully we're able to keep that. I know that that's supposed to expire um, July 1st, um, but that rate um, has been helpful. But with Finn, they've advocated. That's a prime example. They advocated for that rate. They um, showed the data, the numbers. They said, this is what we think will happen if we give these rates, and they were right. I mean, the improvements that have been able to happen within the network because of those rates has made a huge impact, and they have the data to show that. Communication in regards to COVID, um, a lot of what's happening during COVID has to come directly from DCYF. However, um, Finn has been communicating with us, to having those weekly meetings plus I'm communicating with us individually. I'm having individual phone calls with my resource specialist, which happens to be Jenna as well, um, where we're talking about and problem solving and working together um, with that. Finn was able, I, I don't know where the funds came from, if it was that resource that was mentioned earlier in this conversation. Um, we were able to get our, our cleaning and our PPE a lot faster than we were on DCYF. They had it shipped to our place of business. They have called us anything else you need. I mean, for me, I needed protectors for my couches and they were like, you got it. And, and I got them two days ago, you know? So, so they have been able to meet the needs and work through the stuff that they haven't been able to. And that, that has made a huge difference versus the West side. We are nowhere prepared to return to face-to-face -face visits. Offices aren't prepared, social workers aren't prepared. While I have provided PPE for my team, um, that is because I personally live in Spokane, so I've been able to get resources versus the people on the west side that don't necessarily have access to those resources. So it, it, is, it has made a huge impact um, just even within my agency. So on my west side, I have lost um, 30 people. So I started this with 73 people, and I have lost 70 or I have lost 30 people on the west side of the state, and I have only lost one in Spokane. Okay, thank you. Nina, uh, you are in regions three, four, and five. Uh, can you talk about what works well with your contracting and where you'd like to see improvement? Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I am very um, glad that we're having these conversations. They need to be had. Um, I have worked for DCYF for almost 11 years now providing visitation services. Um, it has really been a great eye-opener um, working with DCYF compared to DSHS. Um, there have been improvements with the Sprout um, uh, that has really helped with billing and um, the visit, visit reports. It's nice to see that social workers are able to access those reports and not have to contact Uh, 
and being frustrating um, unforeseen times that we're dealing with. Um, but they have really um, shown that they've fought for us and tried to make sure that we are taken care of by you know, the retainer payments. Um, that being said, I think that there are some improvements um, that needs to happen in regards to responsiveness. Um, we haven't really um, had that great leadership in um, responsive as far as um, communications based on Jay Inslee's uh, conferences and uh, conflict and information by DCYF in regards to um, going back to FaceTime. Um, so that's something that I feel like uh, better communication would be helpful in, um, in, in moving forward. Um, we worked with Region 3, 4, and 5. Um, we've worked with families that have had difficulties um, getting um, access to uh, phones, and um, DCYF has really made it very, um, very helpful to provide concrete goods to those parents uh, that don't have that access. So that was really good. Um, and basically the efforts of just trying to help everybody involved um, with uh, providing gr great services during this time has just been um, a really great thing for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Jacqueline Tutt? Are you on, Jacqueline? Yes, I'm here. I'm sorry, I was unmuting my, unmuting the mic. Welcome. Hi, thank you. So my name is Jacqueline Ted. I'm from Lorraine's Place Two. We work in Region Five predominantly, but we service Four, Five, and Six. We are a child placing agency, and we also um, provide visitation services. So in regards to Sprout, we have been working. Um, really well with that and we actually really like that um, system. I think the one thing that we think could improve is if you don't have someone manning that machine all the time, people, um, you could you could miss referrals and that kind of stuff. So then families are not getting, wouldn't get serviced in a timely fashion. In terms of working during the COVID situation, I want to say, at least from my perspective, I felt like Deanna and them did a wonderful job in trying to keep us abreast of the changes and the times changing at, as quickly as it was. I think the, the concern that I have in terms of being a child placing agency is that not only do we do visitation, we work with the placements that are in, um, that are happening with DC, DCYF and people not being willing to take it, take children in and then um, being penalized for that. But yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Debbie Hood from Region 6. Good morning. It's unmuted. Yeah. The question is, uh, since contracting with DCYF, mm -hmm. Can you talk about what is working well and where you'd like to see improvement in your current working relationship with the department? Certainly. We've been doing services um, for the department for four and a half years. Actually, it'll be five years in January that we've been doing it. Um, we do visitation, concrete goods, and we have the Anderson House, our emergent placement foster home. And we recently had um, written for the pilot program to do the child welfare housing assistance in our county. And we know now that that's on hold. And some of our greatest um, progress we really have seen, it's that two-edged sword of communication. It really and truly has improved. We have some really good points of contact that we can be in touch with. Um, we're getting timely support and assistance. But they're re and really allowing us to implement our service delivery and our individualized approach. Um, 
but as the other presenters have said, it's been the timing of some of that communication that has really put provider agencies in a catch-22. Sometimes we've had information and we've been working the information for two or three weeks before the field has had the information or foster parents and provider agencies have been given, providers have been given information before we've been given information. And so for us, it's just really, how do we seamlessly get that information out to everybody for all of us to work, the, to work seamlessly and productively on behalf of kids and families? Um, where should where would we like to see improvements is what for me i really look at service delivery right now in a triangular approach we have contracts in one place we have program in another place we have the field offices in another place and here we are as the providers in the middle and um, we know contractually how things should be and how the program wants it to be but when we talk with field offices we bump into um, people saying don't tell us how to do our job we'll do our job, you just provide the service. So it's really a difficult place for us right now to have what I feel like is a triangular approach to our service delivery for children and families. I feel like we could get to reunification a lot faster with children and families if services weren't siloed. And what we're doing right now is that we have in-home services that does a certain level. We've got parenting coaches that do a certain level, but the goals are not all communicated across the board. And if we could get to a place where the highest level of service delivery and the most important focus that those children and families should be on, be working towards, if all of us were working towards that, I believe we could get families where they need to go sooner and feel much more support and have better resources for them. During COVID, I agree with the other ladies that um, program has done a dynamite job getting information to us as quickly. It has been wonderful to be able to provide phones and tablets for families to ensure that they're getting that. Um, getting the retainer payment has allowed providers to like hold on and wait until where we're getting back to where we're headed today and get that little bit of funding still coming to them for payment. But that one challenge remains is the communication still. We're just now finding out today when we've got people geared up to go back to face-to-face -face visits that it's been extended now until July 1. And so it really puts, I feel like I have egg on my face as a provider right now when I've worked hard to get my people back into the field parents wanting their visits. And now we have to say, nope, can't do those today. And I think if I wanted you to have one thing to walk away with is that two years ago, we were asked to come up with a way to save um, as an agency. And we created a cost savings plan, a proposal that had a rate increase, a proposal that had um, full mileage from zero one, and that savings would have been was $2 million for our agency alone. So I think there's a way to look at this, provide the quality of service, and still have some um, funding supports necessary going forward. Ruth, you're on mute. Um, do you feel like your suggestions or recommendations for improvement are heard when you make them? Is there a real uh, dialogue with the department? I, I don't believe when we put forth the, the information and that would have saved $2 million was heard. I think it was sent on, it went to an end of it, it went to a certain person and that was the end of it. Yeah. Does anyone else have a perspective on that? For any of the other providers on the panel, Angela, Jacqueline, or yeah, um, Go ahead. I, I pretty 
I pre-planned some of my answers, but one of the answers to my question sort of addressed that. So if you, you know, repeating the question that she just answered, if you could have the oversight board walk away with one key point you wish them to remember as they continue to ensure GCYS makes progresses, my answer to that is we need rate increases. Even with the upcoming budget cuts, we've been struggling for the past several years. For established agency of over 12 years spread across all regions and being one of the larger ones until recently, people simply can't do this job with the rates we receive. No matter how much they are passionate about the work that they have, they have to pay their bills and support their families. If, even if we only got from mile one, at least that would be something. When you get to a job, when you go to a job at McDonald's that pays $15 an hour as benefits and education options or true value starting at 18 an hour, why would people do this? It's stressful. We are not paid for our admin time. We don't get all of our miles paid, miles paid for. The rates have not kept up with the minimum wage or the cost of living. This work is not stable and consistent as families often don't show up or miss visits. COVID has only made this worse because of a lack of support um, from social workers, the communication amongst the agency as far as what the heads are wanting. So Deanna, Tim, Kelly, they have been great with having these calls and communicating to us what they want us to do, but it's not getting down to everybody else. No, they're not on the same page. Each individual social worker, each office, each region is working under different understanding as far as what needs to be happening right now. As, asking us to do face-to-face -face visits without being prepared, I have lost, as I said earlier, some a significant amount of my people. And so before it was a rate issue and now it's, you know, there's no stability right now. When are we returning? Are we getting a retainer? Are we not getting a retainer? Um, you know, I have to return to work or I'm not going to get paid even if I don't feel that it's safe to return to work. Um, you know, there, there's so many issues involved with that. Um, and while I think that the department hears this, as I, I, as many other agencies have been very vocal about this, it's still not getting addressed. Um, you know, I had a great conversation with Deanna last week, and she, she seemed just as frustrated by me. She says, I'm communicating this with my people. I'm, I'm you know, I, I don't know where this is coming from because we are doing our part to communicate. So I don't think it's necessarily at Deanna's level um, and Tim's level that, that this communication issues are happening. It's occurring in the regions because then I had conversations with each regional area um, Monday and each region told me something different. So, so, so even though these conversations are happening, um, each region and area and office is doing something different, contradictory to what you know, the high ups within DCYF are asking um, us to do and them to do. Um, we have not felt this impact in region one and two, as I had said earlier, um, having been for support and also the pilot rate for mile one and the higher $2 rate per hour. Um, I've only lost one person in Spokane out of all of this. So, um, so yeah, we, we have been talking about this for years. You know, we, we had a 30% decrease from the last recession. So I make 30% less now than I did. And that's not, taking into consideration inflation or cost of living, I literally, if I build the hours and miles that I work now on the spreadsheet that I had 12 years ago, it would be 30% higher. So we got hit hard after the last recession and we have not been, that hasn't been reconciled even during times of prosperity. And it is very scary going into this, this budget and another recession because we lost so much after the first recession you know, and we're struggling. Agencies are really struggling to stay open and keep their people. Um, and so, yeah, I think the department hears us, um, but I also know that the budget constraints are not the department. That is the legislature that has to make those decisions. So, Stephen, you had a comment on the proclamation that might be helpful. Yes, thank you, Ruth. The proclamation, um, it, there's some misunderstanding around it. Yeah at times because it, it has never suspended in-person visits. It has allowed DCYF the flexibility to do virtual visits where there have been um, safety issues. And early in the pandemic, DCYF made a departmental decision to go to virtual visits um, for those reasons, for safety reasons. As the state is opening up, however, um, we would like to return to in-person visits where it's safe to do so. And I really wanna emphasize that we have the so that the proclamation doesn't prevent that, but also what we've been communicating from headquarters, and I understand the frustration because I know that 
communication in uh, in other parts of the agency has not always been consistent. And so we're, we're learning about that and, and trying to address it. But what we have said is visits where they can be conducted safely in person, that should be the first option in the decision tree. And where it cannot be conducted safely in person, then we can continue to do virtual visits. So we're, we're not asking folks to put themselves at risk, either providers or our or our um, staff or families or children that are involved. Um, but, this is, but, it, but there is some um, misunderstanding around that, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let me interrupt here a minute. This is Representative Dent. So thank you, Stephen, for that explanation. But uh, we have been working with many stakeholders who have seen some uh, uh, constitutional issues here. So we've tried to work through them and have worked uh, with DCYF and I've had personal conversations with uh, with uh, the secretary over the same issue, but I do appreciate your uh, your great explanation of the issue. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think Jacqueline, you wanted to um, respond to some of the questions. Yes, I just wanted to say I do concur with Debbie and Angela. The problem that I am seeing is that I'm, or maybe I'm misinterpreting or missing is we were. As we get ready to provide the service in regards to going back to visitation in regards to COVID, basically the liability falls on the agencies. And so <clears throat> that is a big concern for us because then we're not able to serve as many because we're having to really be mindful with the populations that we serve it, with, with COVID. And so if, if now I'm hearing that, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong that you're saying that you guys are taking some of that liability maybe I missed the boat somewhere and Angela I mean I'm, I thought we signed a contract that basically said that we recently signed contracts that basically said they're not going to be liable am I correct Jacqueline I'm sorry are you asking um, Angela or me well both <laughs> Because I thought that the provider yeah, uh, signed the, a contract. The liability. <laughs> Go ahead, Angela. The, liabil the liability is a concern. Um, I personally have paid a few thousand dollars um, in attorneys and um, insurance to figure out um, that research. Um, there is some liability concerns, at least with my particular um, you know, what my particular attorney has told me uh, may be different than, you know, because they all have different responses, but that being listed as essential by the governor was really the big kicker. And my understanding is that the governor has labeled us as essential workers. And so that, according to my attorney, has released a significant amount of the liability. And then um, per my insurance agent and um, attorney, having proper documentation showing that we are taking the protocol seriously so I'm having all of my people do checklists and that kind of stuff also decreases our liability. So while I was highly concerned about the liability issues and there still is a concern now, I am much less concerned after talking to an attorney, after talking to my insurance carrier, after the governor has listed us as essential workers, um, and then me producing my own documents and release of um, release of liability or hold harmlesses within my own agency, um, I'm not as concerned about that anymore. But that's my, me individually, I know that that is a concern and was a long, is a, was a huge concern for many providers um, and still is. But me personally, I have, I have been able to work around it, I guess you could say. Okay, Katie, I think you had a question of the providers. Yes, thank you so much. I actually have a question or request of Steve. Um, Steve, you know I'm a big fan of written guidance. I ask for this frequently. So it's, the, it's obvious just on this call, but in so many aspects, there is not clear guidance of the proclamation coming from DCYF. There's so much confusion. And I ask, is it possible for DCYF to produce something that states exactly what you just said, that in-person visits are not suspended, because what the caregiver community is gonna hear with the proclamation extension today is that they are suspended and we don't discuss this again until July 1. Right. And I know from being on webinars that that's not what the proclamation says. So 
it needs to come from somewhere, some interpretation of what the proclamation really says. Great. Um, no. Thank you, Katie. We can definitely do that. I, it is very helpful to hear that because sometimes from my perspective, I kind of think that that is understood and, and that so if it's not, then we need to clear that up. When I, talk to, when I talk to people about it and when I've heard like Deanna and some other folks discuss it, I hear them say those things, but it may not, that may not be the consistent message from all the local offices and everywhere else. So we should produce something written and we can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my second question is particularly for Nina, Jacqueline, and Debbie. We heard um, the provider in Region 1 talk about how she has sufficient PPE. She's received couch covers and masks. I want to ask for those of you who are not in the FIN network, how is your PPE supply? Do you have sufficient PPE to resume in-person visits where safe? Is that a barrier? So for Jacqueline, um, I can speak for Jacqueline. We have sufficient um, PPE because we went out and got that because again, like I said, we're a child placing agency. So we have different standards that we have to meet and we have to make sure that we're following. And so the biggest piece on this side of the mountain is just um, accessibility, accessibility to the stuff like um, hand sanitizer. That is my biggest push. I've been begging for hand sanitizer for a while. Um, it, it's just, it's not there. And when you go get it, it, you can only get so much at a time. So that's our that's our downfall right there. And Jacqueline? That was Jacqueline. Oh, sorry. Nina? My apologies. Yes, um, yes. We, uh, we, we've provided some uh, PPE for our staff members as well. I know we're still waiting for um, the extra face masks that uh, DCYF has promised. Um, but, you know, that's the same concerns that we're facing is that um, it's difficult to find hand sanitizers, um, you know, uh, the sprays to be able to provide these services. But for now, we have what we need. Hi, this is Debbie. And um, I'm, I can concur the same is that we have what we need. Uh, many of our providers went out and purchased it on their own because they are independent. Um, but it, it's hard to get what we need in order for it to be done um, it, with the fidelity that they're wanting to do it with and as we should be doing it with. So, and we're, we're waiting for the masks from DCYF as well. Okay. If you, um, can you speak to one positive or one more challenging experience you've had as a provider working with DCYF or FIN uh, and how that has been resolved? I mean, you, you have talked about uh, some of the COVID experiences, but I, I think uh, if you can give us more perspective on your relationship with your contracting agency, it would be helpful. This is Angela, and I'd like to give a, um, a, a problem and an issue that I had with Finn that um, I, was, I was very upset about for a while, um, but we were able to work through, so I consider it um, a success. So we have, um, there was a large agency that was lost last year, um, and when that agency was lost, it was the biggest agency in the network, and there was a bit of panic. Um, and so we were encouraged to grow within the agency. And then there were other contractors that were interested in pursuing contracts that were given contracts in the area. And for me, I had recruited um, quite a bit of people. And then when everything sort of evened out, we did not have enough work to provide um, our people. So even up to before COVID, um, I did not have enough work for my people in Region 1. I had recruited and I had lost um, basically all of the people that I had recruited for that growth. And, and I, was, I was frustrated by that because it affected us financially. But going to Finn and talking to them about, you know, this is how an agency operates, that we have fixed costs, that we have variable costs, that... Um, you know, by bringing new contracts in and adding more people, if all of us are adding people at the same time, then we're all going to be hit with a problem and it's going to backfire because then agencies are going to go down because they don't necessarily have 
enough people to maintain their agencies. And when I went to them, I think I felt like they heard me, that they understood that, that they had had been surprised by what happened as well, that they had, you know, good intentions that they need to fulfill their contract with DCYF, that their main goal is keeping capacity. And um, they learned from that experience. And now during COVID, we've all as agencies in region one and across the state have been worried, you know, for me and other agencies that have lost a lot of staff that we didn't have enough work before this happened, what's gonna happen, you know, when we return all of those concerns. And Finn came back and said, you know what? We are solely focused on you guys. We're not gonna add any new contractors. We are going to make sure that you guys have what you need. Our top priority is you. And we're not, and that meant so much to me and talking with some of the other agency owners that that relieved a huge burden. They had encountered an issue last year. We had discussed it. They learned from it, and then they were like, we're going to reevaluate and reprioritize. And so that was a prime example of an experience that I personally had with Finn and how they addressed it. Okay, thank you. Do other providers want to answer that same question? So Nena, Jacqueline, or Debbie? Hi, Krista. It's Debbie. Um, I just want to say that... Um, there has been I, just the change in the background check unit and the timeliness of getting background checks has just been a, a huge plus that I have seen. I just want to give a shout out for that because, you know, we were waiting four or five months for background checks to come in and it, referrals are just piling up and people need services. So just a shout out to the department for the changes that were made with that. Um, I want to say that Another positive for me has just been the ability to have a very open and transparent dialogue with my contracts manager and with our program managers. Anytime that there's been a complaint, an issue, or a concern, they're bringing it to my attention and we are working through it on the spot and we are usually at resolution within 24 hours. So I just, again, feel like that's such a value added service that we're receiving now as a provider. And if I had any other place that I'd like to see some improvements is that when there's a change in leadership within our region, those individuals that we have primary contact with, if there was some kind of an email burst that could come out to us that would inform us would be wonderful. We just found out a couple of weeks ago that one of our local offices has a new um, regional admit or a super AA and we were like, oh, okay, let's get together and meet. But we didn't have any kind of a heads up and that would really be helpful. Debbie, can you, um, you were uh, in the agency when you were contracting with DSHS, correct? <laughs> I think I transitioned in just at that time. Okay, well, I was just, I think it would be helpful for the Oversight Board to get a perspective on uh, the feedback you've provided about open and transparent conversations over contracts. That, um, from my knowledge, is quite a change, and I just would like to hear from the other contractors if they have seen a change in the relationship with the contracting agency and their responsiveness. In all fairness, this is Jacqueline said, I think um, it depends on what region and when you're referring to the contracts. So for region five, um, they sent out the referrals and did things a lot different than what it was in region four. They had a bidding system. And so now that everything is on Sprout, um, it's, we're all getting a different experience and, and referrals and things like that are coming out to you differently. So from this side of the mountain, the Western side of the mountain, you at one point had three different perspectives of how they worked and how they interpreted the contract. Um, for us, our, our communication with Region 5 has always been good in terms of visitation. The piece that, um, that I would bring, I, I concur with everything with Angela and Debbie is saying again is, we don't only do visitation. And so if you don't have someone manning that piece, you could be lost in the shuffle with Sprout. 
um, because we're we're a child placing agency, and so um, that's what I would say that I for us Region Five is great. Region Four has always been on the money with their bidding system, but everybody was doing their own thing, and now they're implement. They have just recently implemented Sprout in the last was it four or five months? <laughs> so everyone's starting to do it. However, there are some people that still don't want to participate in it as workers. Thank you. And Nana, do you have any perspective on the change in the relationship, the contracting relationships with uh, DCYF as opposed to DSHS? I guess there has been great improvements. And um, like uh, Debbie said, Kudos to the department for uh, the turnover rate, uh, the turn turnaround uh, with background clearances. I think that has been really helpful. Um, it has been very frustrating um, having worked with DC, D DSHS um, in trying to recruit and train people, um, you know, and not getting the background clearance maybe four, four, three, three to four months later. Um, so getting these background clearances is giving us an extra oomph to want to go out there, recruit best people for the job, and to be able to provide these. A lot of delays in billing and as you all know we all have to pay our staffs we all have to make sure that our bills are paid and so the extra wait time in making sure that this is returned to us um, I feel like I'm afraid might cause some problems um, in, in retaining workers as well okay thank you and might I, I would add like that to I really appreciate Diana and um, all of the um, departments, TMs, uh, Steve, they've been amazing in really trying to help us and you know fighting for us and making sure that um, we are taken care of. And I, I've been doing this job for almost 11 years and um, the same talks have been trying to you know make sure that providers are well taken care of and i think it's high time that the oversight board start walking the walk and and talking the talk <laughs> in regards to taking care of us as providers we have been very passionate in doing this job in taking care of these children these vulnerable children and i think that it's time you know i know that diana and the rest of them are doing their job in presenting the information needed um, you know, to you, to the department and to the legislatures, and it, it goes to deaf ears. And that doesn't make us feel like we matter at all. And so I think it's high time. I don't feel like Region 1 should be getting $2 more than Region 3, 4, 5. We are providing the same services. We are doing the same jobs. Um, and so that's something that we need to do is to make sure that all the information go across board and that they are the same. Thank you. This is Angela. Can I speak to a few things that, um, as far as some improvements? Um, background checks have improved significantly. Um, I concur with everybody on that. That's amazing. Sprout, I've been working with Sprout for three and a half years because it's used um, in Region 1, and then I was part of the STRIVE program um, when that first came about. So I've been using STRIVE, I want to say, gosh, or Sprout. Um, for almost four years. And while there are some growing pains that a lot of the agencies are going through now, I can tell you in the long run, it's more of an efficient process. Um, and it is a huge improvement to what we were doing before, as far as referrals getting out, um, you know, getting information, having that on there, um, being able to quickly take a case, assess it, reject it, so what? So that has been an improvement by the department. Um, in comparison to DSHS versus DCYF, um, communication, while communication is lacking, I think, with the COVID thing within the department, it used to be where you went from the low ups and the low ups, you know, the lower people um, communicated with the high ups. You know, you didn't, you didn't go contact the high ups, otherwise there would be repercussions or, you know, there would be a lot of um, anger and frustration from some of the other people. 
but that has changed. I feel like I can readily call Tim or I can call Deanna or I can call Steve and say, hey, I have this issue. And they take my call and they listen. So that is a huge improvement that we even have access to headquarters and that headquarters is communicating with us, even though there's confusion within the department. Um, as far as the pilot rates in Spokane um, or Region 1, I think that the intent behind the pilot rate was to see how it could improve services. Um, you know, would this make a difference? And I think that that has spoken for itself with the success in Region 1 combined with the network administrator. It has served its purpose. It has shown to improve services, um, diversity, um, quality of people, retention, social workers being able to focus on social worker work versus visitation. Um, it is a completely different ballpark in Spokane. And so the intent behind that rate was to see, hey, is this gonna work? Will this provide us with what we need? And it has provided that. So my take on that would be, we show that this is successful. Let's span this for the rest of the state. Let's give that rate to the rest of the state with miles from mile one and $2 more, because we show that it has been so successful in region one. Okay, thank you, Angela. Um, the last question we have, and some of you have addressed this, but if you could have the oversight board walk away with one key point uh, you wish for us to remember, what would that be? And uh, Angela, or why don't we start with Debbie? Um, I think if you want one, one key point, one thing for us to look at would be that um, culture, a culture change, concept change, and outcomes for children, that if we really and truly value that and, and believe it and we're going to walk our talk, is that we need to do it now. We need to strike right now while we have the audience while we have the momentum. Let's not wait. Let's strike while we've got the challenges. Let's not wait for the timing to be right. Let's be fierce in what we need to do as a part of our service delivery and the change in our approaches. Okay, thank you. And Jacqueline? If I had to, one thing it would be for contracted providers to be able to be reimbursed for mile one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Angela? I sort of read my answer to that a little bit earlier. Um, it's the rates. Um, having recently gone up to Olympia, again, a huge positive to the network administrator. They helped facilitate um, some of the agencies in um, Eastern Washington to get together and go to Olympia to actually talk to legislature. Um, and they have a representative, Erica, on their team um, that is just a rock star and, I mean, amazing. Um, being able to learn how things are done um, in Washington was eye-opening to me. Um, many of your legislatures or, you know, your partners in Olympia have no idea what we do. We know that you guys are hit with, you know, 2,000 probably budget requests from every group possible. Um, and how to keep track of that, I'm sure you guys struggle. And, you know, how do you choose between, you know, supporting the kids and supporting, you know, military, you know, all kinds of, of different budget decisions that you guys need to make. Um, so share with your fellow teammates the importance of this, that while you are going into a budget um, crisis, that this needs to not be overlooked because if you overlook it, there's going to be ongoing repercussions for the years to come. We are struggling and we are, we are having a hard time holding on. And so in the long run, it seems, okay, let's put that off another year or two or whatnot. But I'm telling you, some of us can't hold on for another year or two. You're going to lose more providers, which means that it's going to put more stress on the department. It's all interconnected. So social workers, are now doing visitation. They were not hired to do visitation. They're working long hours, weekend hours. So you're having a higher turnover rate within your social workers because they're doing a job that they weren't hired to do. You pay a brand new person six to eight weeks 
to be trained to come on and leave the job within a month or two, that's a huge budget issue. Also, visits that aren't occurring in some of the western parts of the state are getting hit with contempt of court and fees associated with not doing visits. That's a cost to the department. Um, so while you see this big cost of getting us from mile one, in some ways it will save in other areas of the department, especially as you go into a hiring freeze, having high turnover within the department is not good because you may not be able to replace those people anytime soon. So making sure that your providers are doing what they're supposed to and being able to continue to do what they're supposed to do is going to be better for the department as a whole. We are partners in this. Okay, thank you. And Nina? Yes, um, we are all in this together. Um, like we said, we're trying to build stronger communities and we can't do that by not uh, listening and heeding to the needs that will get us there. And so, as we've stated, we've we've really hung on, hung in here. Um, we've we've been doing this job because this is what we enjoy. We we're passionate about serving these children and the families in the community. And um, it is not fair that we are not compensated in regards to uh, funding. Um, and I think it's high time if we want to provide quality quality uh, services and ensuring that we get quality people to to do this job with us. I think that we need that funding. We need the mileage uh, from one um, because we are using our vehicles and we're using insurances that are increasing on a daily basis. Um, so please help us do the best job that we can do for these families. Okay, thank you very much. I, I believe Lonnie had a comment she wanted to make. I did, thank you. Um, just kind of going back real quick to the confusion about in-person visits and when it was safe to do so. That confusion also hit amongst the tribes as well. Um, so this is more of a two-part comment. Um, one, I'm glad to hear that there's going to be some clarification coming down. Um, but the other piece of this is when the pandemic happened and in-person visits shut down really quick, one of the things that we didn't think about, and I, I want the department and providers to keep this in mind is what about our clients who have trauma around video or virtual equipment? And we actually ran into that with one of our clients. We, we offered virtual visits and she could not handle that. We found that out later throughout the case. Um, and so then when we asked to do supervised visits, we offered ourselves as tribal staff, we can do it safely. We can, we can be outside so that's, you know, lots of air, you know, that you know, can be mixing around. We're not going to be cooped up inside. We can provide masks. We can bring hand sanitizer with us. Um, unfortunately, the state denied our request to be able to do that. So um, we took that all the way up to Secretary Hunter and he told us, no, you should have never been told that. Um, so we did get that, that cleared up, but the fact remains, I don't think my client is the only one that struggles with trauma around virtual uh, or video conferencing equipment. So it's just something I want us to keep in mind as we're still going toward virtual visits. How can we as providers and the state make sure that if we can't, if for some reason we have to shut down in-person visits again, I, I, all I can think about is that we're going to be causing more trauma by keeping these kids and these parents separated, though, you know, if they can't have visits, if the only option is video or virtual visitations. Um, this, this is, I know this is kind of a, a raw thought process that I'm going through right now, but I just wanted that known. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Moni. Um, I think uh, this pandemic has uh, created more challenges and barriers than any of us could have imagined. And uh, we're all trying to navigate it. And sometimes it's, a, successful and sometimes it just uh, can't be successful because of there are so many uh, different factors playing into it that I um, I really appreciate you raising the concern and uh, the department's uh, responsiveness to it. So with that um, I want to thank um, all of you so much for participating in this panel and for giving your perspective on 
contracting, I have to say it is very encouraging to hear about some of the changes that you are seeing uh, in your relationship uh, with the department and uh, their responsiveness to your concerns. That was truly one of the original visions of the, the new department and, uh, and it is really encouraging to hear that there is substantial progress being made and that you are seeing that in real terms. Uh, so I want to turn this back now to Stephen Grilly, uh, who's going to talk about the challenge or challenges of the network administrator model. Uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ruth. And I'll just say very quickly, just echo your thanks to the panel. Um, I've had a, the opportunity to meet and talk with um, several providers in, of visitation services. It is It has always impressed me as an extremely committed group. And so I'm really appreciative, Angela, Nina, Jacqueline, and Debbie for your input today. It's um, been one of the highlights of the meeting. And I do believe that we are all in this together. Um, so that said, let me move quickly to share my screen here. Don't know why this slide is not advancing. Sorry about that. Steve, let us know if you want us to pull up the slide deck because we do have it ready if you need us to do that for you. I don't know why it's not cooperating. If you want it to, in the interest of time, if you're able to pull that up, that might be helpful. Sure thing. Nicholas, I'll have him do that because that was, I think I was probably working on it right now. Excellent. Thank you. And then if we could, we need to advance to slide number 10, it looks like. Yes, right there. Thank you. So in, I know we were you know, scheduled to talk about challenges to the network administrator model, and I wanna reframe, if I can, I'm just I'm taking a little bit of liberty here, I, I recognize that, and reframing the discussion a little bit to talk about challenges to family time in general. Um, I, I wanna say um, that Sheila and Finn have been great partners to us. I, I, don't, for, I don't see challenges in working with Finn, and, and we're not at a place yet where, the, where we have the data to talk about impact yet. Um, so talking about kind of challenges of the network model in the way that um, we were originally understanding it, I, I'm not sure I can do that today. What I can say is that I have rarely left a phone call with Sheila or anyone working for Finn where they have not asked what they can do to help the department. Um, and the things that we're facing are things that I think are general to family time in general as challenges. And, and where I'd like to start is just by talking about the overall picture of family time and the size and shape of it, because I think this is in and, in and of itself part of the challenge. So as you look here on this slide, you can see that we have about 7,400 children in out-of-home care at this time. And 88% of those um, fall into the family time population. So those are children who require visits. These are kids that are under 18. So we've, we've excluded those over 18 and anyone who is legally free, and that leaves us 6,500 children in need of visits. Of those, 61% have current visit plans, so 3,900 children. There is a segment that don't have current visit plans. Um, I can certainly address questions on that if we need to, but I wanna keep moving to. Um, I'm happy to come back to it. 79% of those with current visit plans are with contracted providers, so 3,100 children, and those are the children for whom we can easily extract data in Sprout. There are um, about 800 youth who are um, in visit arrangements that are um, facilitated by social workers or by family members, can um, care foster parents. And so um, we can get that data. It's a little more difficult at this point because we have to get that out of case notes. So that's a by hand situation. But you can see here, 
that there's uh, one of the challenges that we face is, is getting data on the entire population of, of youth. And if we can go to the next slide. We wanted to uh, bring this forward as well so that folks could take a look at the race ethnicity of children with contracted visitation. So this is of the 3,100 children with current visit plans. This is the um, racial and ethnic breakdown within the regions. And you can see here um, some of the themes of what we've talked about today in terms of disproportionality. And I'll let people just look at that for a minute. And then we can move on to the next slide. Now here you see the total um, contracted visits by region. This represents over 30,000 contracted visits on referrals during this period of time for this, this five week period. So that is, that is a count of total visits that are um, involved in, in, that are on visit plans per child. Uh, we wanna point out to the left over here that this, this Sprout data is preliminary. So again, Sprout was rolled out um, statewide in March of 2020. Um, all the data for regions two through six should be considered preliminary. This data collection um, is still new and the refinement of that data collection is still ongoing. And so we just wanna caution folks that um, what you see here is um, our, best, uh, our best effort at the moment, but that, that data is still undergoing some refinement. And you can see here that region six, um, region one, region five um, are doing a number uh, more visits than the other regions and some of that relates to some of what providers have talked about in terms of rates and costs of doing business on the western side of the state, so in, um, at least in regions three and four, those costs are higher. And so we have uh, more difficulty um, with the provider network in those areas, and, and some of that then work falls back on the, the caseworkers to supervise visits in, in these areas. If we go to the next slide. This is a trend analysis. So you can see for um, over that same period, the 29th of March through a uh, slightly different period, 29th of March to the 31st of May, um, region one, so that's uh, in Finn's catchment area is up around the 90% mark for completed visits. Um, you've got um, region six coming in very close to that. So on the Western side of the state, and then the other regions kind of fall in, in between with the same preliminary um, thoughts about the Sprout data. What you see here too is a slight decline as we get towards 31st of May and completed visits. Our best explanation for that as we've kind of explored this is that there's a lag in data entry. Um, visit reports uh, sometimes come in Long, uh, in time periods that are beyond five days. So right now the contract calls for five days and right now they're, they're in some cases coming in later and they may not be reflected um, as visits that occur during this time period, but because the visit report is entered late. If we go to the next slide. So that, you know, I just wanted to give a, a, an understanding of kind of the picture of family time across the state and as I don't think anything on this slide will be a surprise to anyone as we've talked about for quite a while, family time and um, the challenges that face it. Really the first one that we um, encounter is that family time providers are managing their agencies under the same rate that they have been since 2008. You've heard this several times already in the discussion um, today. And in many places, uh, there's no mileage reimbursement after mile, or I'm sorry, until mile 60. This um, you know, has an impact on quarter order visitation services are underprovided in high cost of living regions. Um, some of our providers have noted that as well. Contractors are struggling with capacity, um, which affects timeliness, consistency, and quality of family time. Angela's noted, for example, she's lost um, 30 of her staff. Quality of providers for family time services and assessing supervision levels have all been issues that, that present as family time challenges. These are not specific to FIN, this is for, you know, statewide. Um, child placement location, and I know Sheila's talked about this too, especially in regions one and two, it's a challenge. It's very rural. <clears throat> if children are placed far from home, 
and you have to facilitate a visit, often providers are driving hundreds of miles for a single visit. Um, very challenging to do and very difficult for children, especially young ones, to be on long, you know, long drives to participate in visits. Um, it is a, it's a, it's difficult. There has been, as we've noted, a lack of statewide data historically. So um, getting a picture of how this is unfolding across the state has been challenging. We are grateful to have Sprout at this point and to have it rolled out because I, as, you know, as we've noted going into the future, it will give us more information about um, how this is working and where we need to make improvements. In the past, there have been um, a lack of outcome measures. PBC is addressing that. We're bringing that forward through that process and the continuous improvement process that I um, talked about in the first segment today when I had a few minutes earlier today. Um, so now, uh, looking forward to that continuous improvement process and putting some outcome measures in place should be a, could, should help us drive this this uh, system towards better performance. And I think we are all aware, you know, court orders and expectations. There are sometimes visits that are ordered um, at frequencies of four times a week, and I'm not I'm not debating that that is um, good for kids in several situations. But in an, from an implementation standpoint, that is difficult to carry out. So there are some, um, there are some um, you know, orders that we need to meet that in, from an implementation perspective uh, become very challenging. And sometimes, for example, I think I've heard Sheila talk about in those situations, especially if there are sibling groups, you have to take multiple vehicles and you have to make, uh, to transport for one visit. Uh, the complexity of doing this is, is very, uh, is I think un, unknown by many folks who think, it, you know, it should be easy to just transport a kid to a visit and transport back. It's really not that simple. Um, cultural inclusion and adaptation have been an ongoing issue, I think, in family time. We've talked about the need for bilingual providers, the need to adapt services to tribal and Spanish-speaking uh, populations and other, um, and other cultures as well. And that is something that um, I know Sheila addressed uh, shortly this morning, and something that continues to be a, a general family time challenge. If I had to say, one of the things, if we go to the next slide, that I would say about working with our network administrator would just be the things that, we, that would come up before working with any contractor. Um, this is not specific to you know, FIN, being, um, FIN being a challenging agency to work with. That's not, we're not experiencing challenges with FIN. We do want to focus with them, as we would with other contractors, on some of the things that you see here on this slide, including the, that dispute resolution process, some contract monitoring um, approaches, network expansion, which I know that Sheila and others at Finn are working very hard on. It's, it's challenging um, in the best of circumstances, especially if we um, aren't able to address the rate issue. Re-engagement re of providers that have left the network is an interest of ours, and of course, planning for that rural network development. And that's where I would leave it in terms of setting up a discussion around challenges. I, I you know, I, I do want to reframe it from challenges with network administrator to challenges with family time in general, because I don't think this is a network administrator um, issue, the types of things that we're facing in this, in this realm. Thank you, Steve. Uh, as you know, um, our goal today is to really understand the differences uh, mm -hmm. between the network, network administrator model and contracts that are directly uh, managed by the department. And I guess I'd like you to go through these five points. And, uh, and I, I wanna understand if the network administrator model uh, was disappeared, how would the department uh, transition to this in, uh, in regions one and two where contracts are now managed by the network administrator. Yeah, I think we would need to do that the way that we, the way that we do in the other regions at this point, we'd have to set up that same system where we have visit coordinators and um, visitation leads. And I know that um, as the providers have noted, there are some problems with communication. Um, hopefully we've been able to be responsive when those things are brought to headquarters um, and we need to work on being more consistent with communication. Um, 
but we do have uh, folks in place in regions three through six, for example, who are doing some of the same things that are occurring um, in regions one and two around um, dispute resolution, for example, that might come to the um, either the visit coordinator or to Deanna at headquarters. It might go through the, the visitation lead within the region. Um, and these are folks that we, we haven't created positions for them. They're, they're existing um, positions. Contract monitoring, we have a um, contracts uh, division. I'll, I'll, I'll call it, it's not really a division, but there is a, um, a group of folks that uh, monitor contracts out of headquarters under Steve Cotter, and that would be um, a function that that group of folks would take on. Network expansion, I'm, I think, would be challenging for us. It is uh, something that we would, that is done through the regions um, in, in the areas where, that are not covered by the network administrators. So regions three through six, the regional administrators and the deputy regional administrators um, are often interacting with community providers and others to talk about uh, what needs they have in those regions and how to meet those needs and they would be setting up um, additional discussions around contracting. Re-engagement in providers that have left the network, I think would be something that again, would go through um, the folks that are set up to do the dispute resolution and to talk about, and so that might be the visit coordinators or the program, uh, the leads in those regions, as well as the DRAs and the RAs. They do involve themselves um, in the work in their regions around when there's, um, when there are provider complaints or when there's something that needs to be resolved. Headquarters can also be involved in that. Deanna is, uh, works well with the regions in um, helping resolve some of those things. And rural network development, um, I don't have an easy answer for that one. It is a challenge. Uh, we would have to do that again through the regions and working through, you know, if, if for example, Finn went away and we needed to figure out together as a department how to develop the network in, in region one, Deanna and I would have to be on the phone with um, Jeff Kincaid and, and Rob Larson out there, the, the RA and the DRA to figure out what do we need to do to kind of move these, you know, move these services forward and how can we help do that? What, and so that's where I would uh, leave that. Well, uh, the, the focus of, uh, of the oversight board's work is on really trying to assess outcomes and how they have improved or not improved. And I have to say it's frustrating to, uh, at this point, not have data, that hard data that we can look at that really uh, shows us if the, the resources and the effort that's gone into the network administrator uh, are providing those better outcomes compared to other parts of the state. Um, particularly regarding visitations and, uh, you know, the, the core work that is so important for improving outcomes for children, those work with parents and with children. Um, so it's, it's very hard to assess it from the oversight board's uh, perspective at this point. Uh, and I just wondered if, if you have any comments on that. Oh, I would, I would agree with you. I think that is difficult to assess. It's one of the reasons that, um, you know, to, to be plain that I didn't come to this meeting and say, this is, this is what we think the impact of Finn is, because I don't have the ability to say that from the data that we have. And I don't, I don't think that would be fair to them. Um, I don't know, Vicki, are you still on? Are there thoughts that you have here around data? Yeah, so um, uh, we, I would agree with Steve. We also uh, wish that we were further along in evaluating this. In order to do that evaluation, we need comparison data, and that comparison data uh, is just now being collected in the region other than the network administrator. So as you, as you all are aware, standing Sprout Up, getting it spread to the rest of the state has been quite an effort um, involving a lot of resources. We feel really good about where it is now. Data collection from the rest of the state is starting to come in. And we do have a plan for analyzing those data uh, in the context of our outcomes-oriented performance-based contracting. So we do expect to have good data linked to family data where we can look at outcomes for kids and families, including the near-term outcomes of, uh, of uh, timeliness of receipt of visitation, and uh, 
quality indicators associated with delivery of the visitation, as well as longer term outcomes about contribution to permanency. Um, so we do expect to have those. We're just now getting the data in. So we look forward to sharing those with you when they're available. Thank you. And do other members of the board have uh, any reflections or comments you'd like to make on what we've heard this morning? Well, this is Jeannie. I uh, very much appreciate everyone's um, testimony today and the information that's been shared and the thoughtfulness with which uh, even bad news uh, can be delivered. And uh, I, of course, I'm sitting here and some parts I've had my, my video off for a reason because I know it's very stressful listening and, and seeing people's responses to emotional testimony. And I didn't want to uh, almost feel like a voyeur sometimes on these Zoom calls, but um, I also didn't want to share my own uh, emotion about uh, the financial challenges ahead. I appreciate very much what the department has been doing with uh, making um, some very difficult proposals uh, to the governor, uh, but we have had now the the uh, the first shoe has fallen uh, with the with the revenue forecast, um, and soon the other shoe will drop on the caseload forecast, and uh, we are going to be facing such a difficult uh, year, particularly as we get through the first year of this, because we have to balance our budget. Uh, by June of, of 2021, and it's looking like it's going to be about $4.1 billion and growing, depending on the size of the caseload, so uh, that we're going to have to reconcile some way, and uh, the options are not plentiful about how to do that, uh, and so listening to the resolve and the dedication of people providing services to children and families, um, which quite probably and always will be a primary focus of the people that are on this board, um, it's also daunting to think how we're going to move through this coming three years, and uh, but particularly the first year. forward uh, through this this difficult time. Thank you, Senator Daniel. Representative Kagi, if I could uh, make a comment. Uh, one of the things that we've talked a lot about today is the, the role that the network administrator concept has with regard to family time. It's a, a, obviously a very important, large part of what they do. But the original formulation of a network administrator assumed uh, a wide range of activities with a wide range of programs. Uh, we didn't talk much about concrete goods and services and all the other family-based services, but the network administrator idea was not just to ration scarce resources that exist in the community, but to derive efficiencies, to use uh, the uh, leveraging of, of community resources as well as, as increasing accountability and, and advocacy. So I, I do think that we, today we've had a fairly narrow discussion about what the capabilities of the network administrator model is. And at some point I'd suggest that we, we really spend some time on what it was that in the bills that you sponsored um, and really the hopes and aspirations for the network administrator concept beyond what we've discussed today. Thank you, Ben. Does anyone else have any comments? Ruth, um, there is a question submitted uh, from Bobby to just ask Vicki if we have a timeline around when we could get that data that was evaluating um, the comparison between 
the network administrator model, model service delivery and none. Thanks, Krista. And I've gone ahead and responded in writing in the chat box. Uh, we consider the data uh, from regions two through six preliminary for the first three months. So we expect after a good solid six months of data to pull it, link it, and start working with it. So we expect probably, I would think around December, we'll have the initial analysis comparing, being able to compare the regions for some initial outcome. Bobby, did you have a comment? Just thumbs up, okay. I just wanted to uh, just, just say a little bit as well, just uh, as Senator Darniel was reflecting too, that um, as much as, you know, I want to take a teeny bit of pressure off the, whether it's the department or FIN or the network uh, administrator model or any of that. And some of the, the financial needs and the frustrations are definitely on the legislature and the governor's office in terms of our budgeting and not necessarily a fault of the of the system per se, but just of the, um, the resources that we are giving to them to be able to utilize. And, um, and I think that, um, I, again, as Senator Darnielle said, I hear loud and clear, whether it's the mileage or the, the different visitation, that, um, you know, that again, that is a fault of a lack of resources that we have uh, designated for this purpose. And as Senator Arneal also put it out, um, I had to pop off for a few minutes early on, so I may have missed some things, but the reason I dropped off is because we were talking about the budget shortfall with the economic forecast that just came in yesterday. And we're looking at $4.5 billion just in this next year uh, of, of uh, budget reduction, of, of revenue shortfalls. And so, uh, it's just, it's daunting to hear where we've not been up to the snuff already and to think about what not being up to snuff in this coming years uh, will look like. And it's, it's weighing heavy on me. Yeah. Well, and many of uh, the cuts that were made during the Great Recession were to things like visitation rates. And uh, basically, the system has never recovered from those cuts. So to uh, impose cuts on top of uh, the inadequate rates that we currently have uh, is going to take a lot of focus, I think, by the legislature to, to address how we keep this, uh, this system operating effectively and parents being able to uh, see their children and protecting the department, protecting children, how we can do this uh, and do it in a model that is more efficient. So um, does anyone else from the board have any closing comments or uh, observations? No. Can't believe we're going to in this meeting early. <laughs> uh, this is Lonnie. So, um, when Wendy Thomas, she had to step off, but she did want me to bring back her original question to attention, um, which was, you know, how how is Nate, you know, data around Native Americans um, being tracked within the impact network? So I just wanted to bring that back for follow up later. Okay. Thanks. So this is Angela. I don't know if I'm considered part of the board, but um, as far as a budget thing that you guys could look at doing that would not affect necessarily an increase in costs is working with the judicial system, um, the amount of visits that they're court ordering, but also when we have inconsistent parents decreasing the amount of visitation that they're court ordered to have. That sounds harsh. Um, but if we have inconsistent parents that are bogging down the system um, where you know, parents have had ample opportunity to get visits and are consistently not showing up for visits, I think that there needs to be some um, consequences within the court system reducing that amount of visitation or the department 
having the flexibility in order to do that because that is a huge financial burden for us as agencies to continually take cases that are inconsistent. So in a way that would save you guys money um, because if you took out some of those inconsistent families and those parents, then you would not be paying for those no-show visits that are happening. Um, so then families that are committed to participating within the department and participating within their services and visitation are gonna have the opportunity to get visits and hopefully reunite their kids sooner. Um, so getting the judicial system on the same page as um, the department would be helpful. And I don't know how legislation, legislation plays into that, um, but that would be a way to save the state money for sure. All right, Angela, thank you. Um, we also uh, are going to very briefly discuss the board schedule that we uh, approved previously. And I think Krista is going to put that up on the screen. So just to walk through this real quick, this was attached to the board materials that were sent out, um, I believe last Friday and yesterday. And this, this is really a side by side from what we originally planned for the year on the left side, which were in-person meetings and then the impacts of the pandemic, both with canceling a meeting in March and then how those topics have shifted. Um, so you should have that in your attachments. And Nick, if you could just scroll down um, to the second page too. So the purple on the left side and it was on the, on the previous page shows what was originally scheduled and then how we, um, those are ones that need to be rescheduled and have been shifted. So on the left side, um, they show up in purple as well. It just shows how we would manage the same topics that the board discussed in January. The question here is, is this still what the board wants to visit for the, the rest of the year? There's been some additions, including um, in September, doing a little bit more of a conversation with the department in the culture change and communications realm, particularly around lessons learned in the COVID-19 response. So we have incorporated some of those changes, but really it's just um, been shifting around the topics that were already decided upon. Um, so I wanna open that up just in case the board wants some changes. I do wanna make a note that we do have this as all the rest of our meetings for the year will be in a Zoom format. Um, that is because as staff, we have been given the direction that if we um, can work from home, uh, we will be doing so for the foreseeable future. That said, uh, with the Open Public Meetings Act, we, we are working with our AG in case there are some, um, some things with that that we as staff need to make sure that we're in compliance of, but we will plan to make sure our meetings are accessible on Zoom for at least the rest of the year. Um, and with that, I'll just open it up if there's any reflections on changes to topics or um, if we're on the, on the right path still to maintain what we decided upon in January, even though there's been some changes. So Krista, this is Lois. There's um, a couple of things. I still would like to go back to um, the conversation that we had started, I believe at this point, I can't remember if it was April or May, but just about the responsibility of oversight board members. Um, the other thing I know we had at one point talked about a retreat, which I, with our current social distancing, that makes it very difficult, but I don't know if it can happen in 2020, but at some point it would be good for our um, board to kind of come together again, like we did initially. But the one piece I think we should add to it is um, some type of anti-racism training. Mm -hmm. I think that that would be um, really impactful and helpful um, to, so we're all looking at these issues, at least from, from that, that lens of equity. Great. Thank you, Lois. I think that would be helpful, Lois, and, and we can explore whether, whether any, uh, anti-racism training is available via Zoom or uh, discuss whether that would really be meaningful or not, or we want to wait until we can meet in person. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, looking at the July uh, agenda, I'm not sure, and I would want to double check with the board, uh, with the department, I mean, how much FFPSA there is to say about that. I think we haven't they have not gotten approval from the federal government on their FFPSA plan and uh, I think things are more delayed than 
ever because of COVID. And so I don't know if that is worth doing in July. And I know we talked about talking a little bit more about the impacts of racial disproportionality and systemic racism. And so I don't know if we want, we could switch that out in July or uh, elsewhere. But again, I'm just not sure FFPSA, if there's much to say there yet. I'm not that's, sure, is there anyone from the, yeah, go ahead. I yes, that, that's correct. There's, uh, we have not received approval of the plan yet. And we expect that with, um, you know, the budget situation implementation will be affected by that. Um, but, but even so, some of what we would need to work on would need to, uh, we need to wait for approval. Well, Lois, at the beginning of this, um, we discussed uh, developing a statement on the part of the Oversight Board, and uh, we will be, uh, Krista will be sending out a doodle poll so that we can, we can form a small group to do that. But I'm wondering uh, if the Board would like to uh, focus on racial disproportionality at the next meeting, uh, both in terms of a statement, but also uh, in terms of what the data is telling us and what the department is proposing in concrete terms, uh, in terms of how they're approaching this, this subject. We uh, have the the uh, racial disproportionate or the racial disparity plan that was sent out, but I think we're all anxious to understand more specifics about how the department uh, is addressing this, particularly given Charles, uh, the comments from social workers that he relayed. So I'd appreciate hearing some thoughts on that. Well, this, this is Bobby. I sure would agree with that. I think there, this is a, um, I have a sense of urgency, and I think um, all of you do. I came in late to your opening remarks, but um, certainly uh, got the context quickly enough. And um, particularly, um, you know, given the fact that we're not going to be at Amara in June, uh, that we need to do that right now. I mean, in the interim, work on a statement, but um, begin to to take deeper dives into what the department's doing, but also what we need to do. Yeah, this is Lois. Again, I would agree with um, with Bobby in that, you know, a plan is only as good as its implementation. Um, you think about, it's just like New Year's resolutions. If you don't follow it through, um, it means absolutely nothing. So I think our role is, um, you know, to be the leaders in this charge. So I'm hopeful that others will agree. Well, and in our case, leaders means, uh, I think, providing oversight on what the department is doing and uh, and reflecting on that and making recommendations to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, thank you for that, Ruth, that clarification. I was referring to us all being leaders in our own right outside of our work here on the oversight board. So thank you for that. Bruce, um, I wonder if I could um, read something. I'm, I think all of us are doing, uh, I hope all of us, I'm sure all of us are doing more introspection and study um, and listening uh, now about racial equity issues than ever before. And certainly in my life, um, I, I'm uh, experiencing many aha moments where uh, my own perceptions have been changed. And, and I wanted to share one particular thing that I've, uh, that has particularly been informing my own thinking as a legislator um, and as a person. And I, it comes from, if you've got a minute, uh, it comes from uh, Dr. King's uh, book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. And I, uh, I also am having a birthday in a couple of weeks and I'll be 71. And I realized that some of the things, much of the things that Dr. King wrote about uh, before his death 
um, were very wise and prescient, uh, but you know, could have been written yesterday um, that we've not made really any progress or much progress in over 50 years. And uh, so this was particularly written in the, uh, the 1967. Um, and in a big, big section on um, that he titles, Why is Equality So Assiduously Avoided? Um, and he talks here about, and this is a quote now, overwhelmingly America is still struggling with irresolution and contradictions. It has been sincere and even ardent in welcoming some change, but too quickly apathy and disinterest rise to the surface when the next logical steps are to be taken. Laws are passed in a crisis mood after a Birmingham or a Selma but no substantial fervor survives the formal signing of legislation. The recording of the law in itself is treated as the reality of the reform. The, this limit, well, anyway, then he goes on from there saying that, um, that practically speaking, reform involves financial investment. And white America then and now has had a very tough time translating its concern and empathy uh, into hard dollars and real services to address poverty and certainly the families that are affected in the child welfare system and across our service delivery and DCYF uh, from early childhood education on um, have need to involve financial um, intent. And so I think that this is perhaps an opportunity for us to talk about what another part of our silo has been working on and that has been the the uh, concerted effort to talk about how to reduce poverty and how to address systemic racism and bias um, in all forms um, across the spectrum of services that we uh, provide and what we could provide and should provide as a state. Uh, but that we are not going to be able to address this any better than Dr. King was talking about. Oops, my Batteries about ready to run out here on my computer. Uh, sorry. But we're not going to be able to address these things without a larger conversation about uh, poverty eradication and uh, and and the very basis of that being uh, racism and bias. So I I would love to have the opportunity to have an intersection between this oversight board's work and the work of the poverty, poverty reduction uh, task forces. Um, and uh, many of the members of this group may not have seen the report that came out from, from the, the poverty reduction task force. And that would be, uh, Krista, if that was possible for everyone to receive that. Uh, and maybe have that, maybe a presentation at our next meeting from Lori Sphinx, 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 I can never pronounce her last name, sorry. Um, P-F-I-N-G-S-T, um, about the, um, the work of the task force and the, and the, and the, uh, the very strong statements they've made ab about reducing racism in our society might be might be a place to start um thank you Jeannie for that um Tana and I representative Sen and I will uh will work on an agenda for the next meeting that will incorporate uh, focus on addressing 
uh, racism and, and poverty. And if people want to share any ideas, obviously let us know as well. Well, our, our focus has and will continue to be um, really improving outcomes for children and families. That is the work of this oversight board and of the department. And I think uh, today's presentations have been helpful in looking at how uh, particularly the network administrator model has addressed the issue of uh, provision of services and working with uh, contractors to improve services to children and families. And I think we've, uh, we've really developed uh, an insight into some of the improvements that are happening between the department and its contracting relationships with providers. Uh, so with that, I want to ask Representative Sen if she has any closing comments. And I, I really want to thank you all for your attention and your engagement today. Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Yeah, uh, Zoom, very long Zoom meetings are <laughs> difficult. So thank you guys all for your engagement. Um, and thank you to the providers who really shared very honest feedback. I know that sometimes can be daunting to do that um, when you feel like your boss is listening or uh, might put you in an awkward situation. So we in particular want to thank you, everybody, for their, uh, for their very frank conversations, for everybody for listening and, and feeling that this is a safe space to share your uh, you know, emotional concerns and your passions and your uh, kind of where you are with this group because these are some really difficult times and critical work that we're doing all together. And we know that we are all working to make the system better and uh, really making sure that the outcomes are better, not just the systems. And so I want to thank everybody for their, their thoughtful, committed, genuine work to make changes and for, uh, for speaking up and for being part of this team. Uh, it's really it's really humbling to hear from all of you and to be part of this. And it was quite a reflection today, um, thinking about the weight of our of our work, of where we are, both with uh, COVID, with systemic racism, uh, so much in the fore, their budget forecast coming forward, and knowing the importance of what's to come in shaping a whole generation of kids and a whole, uh, therefore a whole societal impact. And again, I'm just really today in particular and after this call and listening and being part of these conversations with everybody, I'm just really feeling that weight and the import of this. So um, thank you for being part of that, for educating me, for keeping these conversations real because um, we, we need this to make good decisions in the coming weeks, months, uh, and, and years. So um, that was a little bit rambly, but just wanted to kind of share where I'm at on that. So thank you, everybody. Um, and that was maybe a little bit more personal than you all need to know, but this is really, um, it's, I'm really moved by this meeting and everybody's participation, openness, and, and sharing. So thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Stay safe. Be healthy. Thank you for having us. Hey, everybody.